and we're recording. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. How are you doing today? You're doing all right? I hope so. Um, are you ready for this new episode? It could be a long one. You don't have to listen to the whole thing in one go. You know, you can just listen to a bit, stop, do something else, come back, continue listening later. Or if, if you want to, and if you can, just stick with me for the whole thing in all in one go. Hopefully it's going to be interesting and there's going to be like lots of learning English uh, potential in this episode. Okay, right. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to doing this one. I hope I can do it well. I hope, I, I hope it comes out well. Uh, I think I better get started. There's a PDF for this um, and you can download the PDF. Just there's a link in the description and you can just download it directly, um, which, you know, could be useful for you. You'll see a uh, script of a lot of the things I'm going to say. I think I better get started. I'm going to start reading from that PDF now. Okay. So if you want to get the PDF ready, just download it. There's a link in the description. You'll find the PDF also on the page for this episode on my website. Um, but you don't have to, you don't have to get the PDF. You can just listen and just enjoy listening. Okay. Right. Let's go. So I'm going to start reading from the PDF in five, four, three, two, one, here we go. Hello, in this episode, I'm going to tell you another story and use it to help you learn English. The story I'm going to read is called Apionis Island and it was written by English author H.G. Wells. I'll explain the title a bit later. I've talked about this story before in episode number 838. In that episode, I talked about a lovely day I had when the sun came out and I sat in a little square in Paris and read an old book of H.G. Wells' short stories, which I happened to have in my pocket. Have you heard episode 838? It was a three-hour episode. Um, so maybe you started listening to it and then you didn't finish. I don't know. Anyway, so I have talked about this story before. So this is the story which I read that particular day and I really enjoyed it and I told you about it and retold the story in episode 838 in my own words. But in this episode, I'm going to read the entire text to you. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it as much as I did on that day, and it'll be good for your English too. So here's the approach I'm going to take this time. I'm going to read the story to you twice. First, I'll read it from start to finish without stopping to explain things. All you have to do is try to keep up with what's happening and hopefully just enjoy listening to everything. Try to get lost in the story. Follow every detail and try to immerse yourself in what's happening. Okay, so that's just when I read it from start to finish. Then I'll read it again. I'll read the story again and we'll explain all the details as I go, including a lot of vocabulary. This story is about 5,000 words. So it's reasonably long and will probably take about 20, mini 20 minutes for me to read from start to finish. Doing that and then explaining a lot of vocabulary afterwards, like going through the entire story and explaining lots of language afterwards, and there is a lot, all of that will probably make this episode very long, but that's fine. It'll be as long as it needs to be. So let's get ready for a good lengthy session of learning English with a short story that's actually not that short. Feel free to read with me as you listen using the PDF or just listen to my words and study the text later in your own time if you want to. A bit of information about the story first. It's worth giving a little bit of background context here because it will help you understand and appreciate the story. So this story was written by H.G. Wells, an English author who is generally considered to be one of the most influential writers of modern times. His influence on literature and cinema is clear, particularly modern Hollywood action, adventure and science fiction films. I read out extracts from one of his other stories, War of the Worlds, on the podcast a few years ago, and that's a clear example of how influential his writing was. Um, but this story, which is not a science fiction story, was first published in 1894, but despite the fact that that is over a hundred years ago, the story is still quite fresh, and I think the language isn't really too old-fashioned. I think it's still a perfectly good representation of English. In fact, it's great writing. 
Very descriptive, clear and evocative and great writing is always worth reading and in my opinion it will have a lot of educational value if you're learning English. A bit of historical context for the story now. So the end of the 19th century was a time of exploration, research and discovery, especially from the European perspective. And travellers from places like England or France would go to other remote areas in order to study and collect things like new animal or plant species and bring them back to be studied or sold. Now this is controversial today of course because there are arguments about the ethics of this and how developed countries have basically profited from the resources of other less developed countries over the years. In fact I think the character in this particular story sort of pays the price for this in a way as you will see. But anyway in those days there were companies that paid people to go out and collect things. So remains of extinct animals such as dinosaurs were particularly valuable and there were private collectors who would pay quite a lot of money for items like dinosaur bones or eggs. The more well preserved these items were the more value uh, they had. Also museums such as the British Museum in London would buy these interesting items and artifacts and then keep them to be studied and put on display. Scientific researchers were particularly keen to acquire specimens. This is how explorers and collectors made their living. So this story describes the experience of a man like this employed by a company in England to go out in search of remains of extinct animal species. It's a sort of adventure story based in reality but with a little twist. So imagine this, okay? Imagine this. At the beginning of the story our first narrator, that's the person telling the story, the, the story is narrated by two people really. You have the first narrator and then the second narrator who is really the main storyteller. But anyway, here's the situation. Our first narrator is sitting in a cafe somewhere in a far-flung part of the world. Far-flung meaning far away. And I, uh, it's really far-flung from an English perspective anyway, right? So somewhere far away from England perhaps somewhere in Africa, he's sitting in a cafe, he happens to have some orchids, these rare flowers, with him and another man is sitting opposite him. This other man has a long scar down his face and is curious about the orchids, about the flowers. So the, the narrator and this man with the scar, they strike up a conversation and the man, whose name is Butcher, then becomes the main narrator of the story as he describes a peculiar experience he had when he was once stranded on a desert island near Madagascar. So a desert island that is a, a little island out in the middle of the ocean, deserted, no people living on it, right? Um, you know, you sort of imagine something like the film Castaway with Tom Cruise. It, Tom Cruise? No, it's Tom Hanks, isn't it? <laughs> if it would be a different film if Tom Cruise was in Castaway, right? He would have run been done he would have done a lot more running um and there would have been a lot more action. Anyway, Tom Hanks, the film Castaway. So in that film, Tom Hanks' character gets stranded on a desert island, right? His plane crashes, he ends up stranded on the island for years. Great film. I love that film. Um anyway, in this one. This guy with a scar on his face called Butcher ends up stranded on a desert island near Madagascar. And Butcher explains how he was in that part of the world employed by a collector to try to find remains, the bones and eggs of an extinct species of giant bird known as the elephant bird or Apionis. So that's why he was there trying to find remains of this extinct massive bird. The remains were to be found in these sort of tar pits or something similar. What are, what are tar pits? A pit is like a, a sort of a big hole in the ground. In this case, holes in the ground that are full of swampy earth and liquid. Um, okay, tar pits, they're like deep swamps. A swamp is like a, a place that's got lots of water and earth and mud in it, a mix of mud and water. 
um, sort of thing you would find maybe next to a river, next to a lake, or next to the ocean. A place where the earth gets really, really inundated with water. And it can be dangerous. If you walk into it, you can sink down into the swamp. So the remains of this elephant bird that Butcher was looking for, these remains were to be found in tar pits. Right? These are like deep swamps full of some kind of oily liquid. Tar is like, a, is like oil. Okay, it's very similar really to oil. Um, the difference is I think that tar is a bit thicker. But anyway, this swamp was full of a sort of oily, tarry liquid which perfectly preserved the remains of animals which must have somehow fallen in there thousands of years ago. The Apionis, the elephant bird, is one of these animals whose bones and eggs could be recovered from these tar pits. The Apionis is in fact a real bird, although it doesn't exist anymore. It became extinct, meaning it died out, about a thousand years ago, people say. It was native to Madagascar and is considered to be the largest bird ever to have lived. Apparently, some species of Apionis used to grow to about three or four meters in height. That's about the size of an elephant. So just imagine that for a moment. Imagine a chicken, for example, Imagine a chicken the size of an elephant, and now imagine standing next to it. It's quite frightening, actually, when you think about it. What would happen if it, if it pecked you with its beak? Now, these elephant birds, which didn't really look like chickens, I mean, they're kind of not dissimilar, really, not dissimilar, flightless birds, um, but, you know, the size of an elephant. These elephant birds were absolutely real. Uh, complete skeletons of them and their eggs have been found, and also the local people have stories about them too. So, absolutely real, the Apionis, the elephant bird. So, back to the story. The job of this explorer called Butcher was to find remains of these birds in these weird pits and bring them back to his employer to be sold in London. And Butcher describes what happened to him while he was doing this. So imagine we're in some sort of remote place, perhaps the southeast coast of Africa on an island off Madagascar. We're probably in a simple cafe or bar there or something similar. The first narrator has a bunch of rare flowers, these orchids, with him. And the other man, Butcher, leans over the table to start a conversation. So now just try to follow the story. And remember that when I've finished, I'll go through the whole thing again and we'll explain everything for you. You'll see that some vocabulary in the text, if you look at the PDF, some of the vocab is highlighted in a pale orange colour. Those are the words and phrases I'm going to clarify later. So here we go, Apionis Island by H.G. Wells. The man with the scarred face leant over the table and looked at the bundle of flowers I'd collected. Orchids? he asked. A few, I said. Cypripediums, he said. Mostly, I replied. Anything new? I thought not. I did these islands 25, 27 years ago. If you find anything new here, well, it's brand new. I didn't leave much. Uh, I'm not a collector, I said. <sighs> I was young then, he went on. My goodness, how I used to fly around. He seemed to measure me with his eyes. I was in the East Indies two years and seven in Brazil. Then I went to Madagascar. I know a few explorers by name, I said, anticipating a story. Who did you collect for? Dawson's. I wonder if you've ever heard of the name Butcher? Butcher. Uh, Butcher. The name seemed vaguely familiar. Then I remembered Butcher versus Dawson. Wow, I said, you're the man who sued them for four years' salary. You got cast away on a desert island. At your service, said the man with the scar, bowing. Funny case, wasn't it? Here was me making a little fortune on that island, doing nothing for it as well, and them quite unable to fire me. It often used to amuse me thinking it over while I was there. I did calculations of it, big ones, all over that damned atoll. Written in the sand, you see. How did it happen? I said. I don't quite remember the case. Well, you've heard of the Apionis, haven't you? Uh, yes, I have. My colleague Andrews was telling me of a new species he was working on only a month or so ago. 
just before I sailed. They've got a thigh bone, it seems, nearly a yard long. The thing must have been an absolute monster. I believe you, said the man with the scar. It was a monster. But when did they get hold of these bones? Um, three or four years ago. Ninety-one, I think. Why? Why? Because I found them. Goodness me, it's nearly twenty years ago. If Dawson's hadn't been silly about that salary, they might have made a fortune. I just couldn't stop the infernal boat going adrift. He paused. I suppose it's the same place, a kind of swamp, about ninety miles north of Antananarivo? Do you happen to know? You have to go to it along the coast by boats. You don't happen to remember, perhaps? No, I don't, but I'm pretty sure Andrew said something about a swamp. It must be the same place. It's on the east coast. Somehow there's something in the swamp water that stops things from decaying. It smells like creosote. It reminded me of Trinidad. Did they get any more eggs? Some of the eggs I found were a foot and a half long. The swamp goes circling round, you know, and cuts off this bit. It's mostly salt, too. Well, what a time I had. I found the things quite by accident. We went for eggs, me and two native chaps, in one of those funny canoes all tied together, and found the bones at the same time. We had a tent and provisions for four days, and we pitched on one of the firmer places. Thinking of it brings that old tarry smell back to me even now. Yeah, it's funny work. You go probing into the mud with iron rods, you know. Usually the egg gets smashed. I wonder how long it is since these Apionises really lived. The missionaries say the locals have legends about it when they were alive. But I never heard of any such stories myself. But certainly those eggs we got were as fresh as if they'd just been laid. Fresh! Carrying them down to the boat, one of my local chaps dropped one on a rock and it smashed. I was absolutely furious, I can tell you. I couldn't contain myself and I gave him a bit of a beating, I have to say. But the egg was perfect, fresh as the day it was laid, not even smelly, and its mother dead for four hundred years, perhaps. The assistant who dropped it said a centipede had bitten him. However, I'm getting sidetracked from the story. It had taken us all day to dig into the sludge and get these eggs out unbroken, and we were all covered with disgusting black mud, and naturally I was cross. As far as I knew, they were the only eggs that have ever been removed, not even cracked. I went afterwards to see the ones at the Natural History Museum in London. All of them were cracked and just stuck together like a mosaic, and with bits missing. Mine were perfect and I meant to blow them when I got back. Naturally, I was annoyed at the silly fool dropping three hours' work just on account of a centipede. I hit him about a bit. The man with the scar took out a clay pipe. I placed my tobacco pouch before him. He filled up absent-mindedly. How about the others? Did you get those home? I don't remember hearing about them. Well, that's the strange part of the story. I had three others, perfectly fresh eggs. Well, we put them in the boat, and then I went up to the tent to make some coffee, leaving my two heathens down on the beach, the one fooling about with his sting and the other one helping him. It never occurred to me that the beggar would take advantage of the peculiar position I was in to stab me in the back like that, but I suppose the centipede poison and the kicking I'd given him had upset him. He was always a bit bad-tempered, and he must have persuaded the other one. I remember I was sitting and smoking and boiling up the water over a little spirit lamp I used to take on these expeditions. Incidentally, I was admiring the swamp under the sunset, all black and blood-red it was, in streaks. A beautiful sight. And up beyond, the land rose grey and hazy to the hills, and the sky behind them was red like a furnace mouth. And fifty yards behind the back of me were these two locals I'd brought along, quite uninterested in the tranquil air of things and this incredible view, plotting to cut off with the boat and leave me all alone with three days' provisions and a canvas tent and nothing to drink whatsoever beyond a little keg of water. I heard a kind of yelp behind me. And there they were, in this little canoe thing. It wasn't properly a boat in the water, and perhaps twenty yards from land. I realised what was up in a moment. 
My gun was in the tent, and besides, I had no bullets, only duck shot. They knew that. But I had a little revolver in my pocket, and I pulled that out as I ran down the beach. Come back, I said, waving it in the air. They jabbered something at me, and the man that broke the egg jeered. Ugh. I aimed at the other, because he was unwounded and had the paddle, and I missed. They laughed. However, I wasn't beaten. I knew I had to keep cool, and I tried him again and made him jump as it whizzed past him. He didn't laugh that time. The third time, I got his head, and over he went into the water and the paddle with him. It was a precious lucky shot for a revolver. I reckon it was 50 yards away. He went right under. I don't know if he was shot or simply stunned and drowned. Then I began to shout to the other chap to come back, but he huddled up in the canoe and refused to answer, so I fired out my revolver at him, but never got near him. I felt like an utter fool, I can tell you. There I was on this rotten black beach, flat swamp all behind me, and the flat sea cold after the sunset, and just this black canoe drifting steadily out to sea. I tell you, I cursed Dawson's and Jamracks and museums and all the rest of it. I shouted at the local to come back until my voice went up into a scream. There was nothing for it but to swim after him and take my luck with the sharks. So I opened my clasps knife and put it in my mouth and took off my clothes and I waded in. As soon as I was in the water, I lost sight of the canoe but I aimed, as I judged, to head it off. I hoped the man in it was too bad to navigate it and that it would keep on drifting in the same direction. Just then it came up over the horizon again towards the southwest. The afterglow of sunset was well over now and the dim of night was creeping up. The stars were coming through the blue. I swum like a champion, though my legs and arms were soon aching. However, I came up to him by the time the stars were fully out. As it got darker, I began to see all manner of glowing things in the water. Phosphorescence, you know. At times it made me dizzy. I hardly knew which was stars and which was phosphorescence, and whether I was swimming on my head or my heels. The canoe was pitch black and the ripple under the bows like liquid fire. I was naturally wary of clambering up into it. I was anxious to see what he was up to first. He seemed to be lying cuddled up in a lump in the bows, and the stern was up out of the water. The thing kept turning round slowly as it drifted, kind of waltzing, don't you know? I went to the stern and pulled it down, expecting him to wake up. Then I began to clamber in with my knife in my hand, and ready for a rush, but he never stirred. So there I sat in the stern of the little canoe, drifting away over the calm phosphorescent sea, and with all the host of stars above me, waiting for something to happen. After a long time, I called him by name, but he never answered. I was too tired to take any risks by going up to him, so we just sat there. I think I dozed off once or twice. When the dawn came, I saw he was as dead as a doornail, and all puffed up and purple. My three eggs and the bones were lying in the middle of the canoe, and the keg of water and some coffee and biscuits wrapped in a Cape Argus newspaper by his feet, and a tin of methylated spirit underneath him. There was no paddle, nor, in fact, anything except the spirit tin that I could use as one, so I settled to drift until I was picked up. I examined him, decided he'd been bitten by some snake, scorpion or centipede unknown, and sent him overboard. After that, I had a drink of water, and a few biscuits, and took a look around. I suppose a man positioned as low down as I was doesn't see very far. In any case, Madagascar was clean out of sight and any trace of land at all. I saw a sail going southwestward, looked like a schooner, but her hull never came up into view near me. Then the sun got high up in the sky and began to beat down upon me. My goodness, it pretty near made my brains boil. I tried dipping my head in the sea, but after a while my eye fell on the Cape Argus newspaper and I lay down flat in the canoe and spread this over me. 
Wonderful things, these newspapers. I'd never read one thoroughly before, but it's odd what you get up to when you're alone, as I was. I suppose I read that old Cape Argus twenty times. The pitch in the canoe simply reeked with the heat, and it rose up into big blisters. I drifted for ten days, said the man with the scar. It's a little thing in the telling, isn't it? Every day was like the last, except in the morning and the evening I couldn't even keep a lookout. The blaze of the sun was so unbearable. I didn't see a sail after the first three days, and those I saw took no notice of me. About the sixth night a ship went by, only about half a mile away from me, with all its lights ablaze and its ports open, looking like a big firefly. There was music aboard. I stood up and shouted and screamed at it, but to no avail. The second day I tapped a hole in one of the Apiornis eggs, scraped the shell away at the end bit by bit, and tried it, and I was glad to find it was good enough to eat. A bit flavoury, not bad, I mean, but with something of the taste of a duck's egg. There was a kind of circular patch, about six inches across, on one side of the yolk, and with streaks of blood and a white mark like a ladder in it, that I thought looked a bit odd, but I didn't understand what this meant at the time, and I wasn't inclined to be too fussy, as I was completely ravenous. The egg lasted me three days, with biscuits and a drink of water. I chewed coffee berries too, invigorating stuff. The second egg I opened about the eighth day, and it scared me. The man with the scar paused. Yes, he said. It was developing. I expect you find it hard to believe. I did, with the thing right in front of me. There the egg had been, sunk in that cold black mud, perhaps three or four hundred years. But there was no mistaking it. There was the, what is it, embryo, with its big head and curved back, and its heart beating under its throat, and the yolk shriveled up, and great membranes spreading inside the shell and all over the yolk. Here I was, hatching out the eggs of the biggest of all extinct birds in a little canoe in the midst of the Indian Ocean. <sighs> if old Dawson had known that, it was worth four years' salary. What do you think? However, I had to eat that precious thing up, every bit of it, before I sighted the reef, and some of the mouthfuls were horribly unpleasant. I left the third one alone. I held it up to the light, but the shell was too thick for me to get any notion of what might be happening inside, and though I thought I heard blood pulsing, it might have been the sound in my own ears, like what you listen to in a seashell. Then came the atoll. Came out of the sunrise, suddenly, close up to me. I drifted straight towards it, until I was about half a mile from shore, not more, and then the current took a turn and I had to paddle as hard as I could with my hands and bits of the Apionis shell to make it to the place. However, I got there. It was just a common atoll about four miles round, with a few trees growing and a spring in one place, and the lagoon full of parrotfish. I took the egg ashore and put it in a good place, well above the tide lines, and in the sun to give it all the chance I could, and pulled the canoe up safe, and wandered about prospecting. It's funny how dull an atoll is. As soon as I'd found the spring, all the interest seemed to vanish. When I was a boy I thought nothing could be finer or more adventurous than the Robinson Crusoe business, but that place was as monotonous as a book of sermons. I went round finding edible things and generally thinking, but I tell you I was bored to death before the first day was out. It shows my luck, the very day I landed the weather changed. A thunderstorm went by to the north and flicked its wing over the island, and in the night there came an absolute downpour, and a howling wind slapped overhead. It wouldn't have taken much, you know, to upset that canoe. I was sleeping under the canoe, and the egg was luckily in the sand, higher up the beach, and the first thing I remember was a sound like a hundred pebbles hitting the boat at once, and a rush of water over my body. I'd been dreaming of Antananarivo, 
and I sat up and shouted to Intoshi, my maid, to ask her what the hell was going on, and I clawed out at the chair where my matches used to be. Then I remembered where I was, all alone, stranded. There were phosphorescent waves rolling up as if they meant to eat me, and all the rest of the night was pitch black. The air was simply yelling. The clouds seemed down on your head almost, and the rain fell as if heaven was sinking and they were bailing out the water above the sky. One great roller came writhing at me like a fiery serpent, and I bolted. Then I thought of the canoe and ran down to it as the water went hissing back again, but the thing had gone. I wandered about the egg, then, and felt my way to it. It was all right and well out of reach of the maddest waves, so I sat down beside it and cuddled it for company. Lord, what a night that was. The storm was over before the morning. There wasn't a rag of cloud left in the sky when the dawn came, and all along the beach there were bits of plank scattered, which was the broken up skeleton, so to speak, of my canoe. However, that gave me something to do, for taking advantage of two of the trees being together, I rigged up a kind of storm shelter with these bits and pieces, and that day the egg hatched. Hatched, sir, when my head was pillowed on it and I was asleep. I heard a whack and felt a jerk and sat up, and there was the end of the egg pecked out and a funny little brown head looking out at me. Lord, I said, you're welcome. And with a little difficulty, he came out. He was a nice, friendly little chap at first, about the size of a small hen, very much like most other young birds, only bigger. His plumage was a dirty brown to begin with, with a sort of grey scab that fell off it very soon, and he didn't really have feathers, it was more like a kind of downy hair. I can hardly express how pleased I was to see him. I tell you, Robinson Crusoe doesn't make nearly enough of his loneliness. He looked at me and winked his eye from the front backwards, like a hen, and gave a chirp and began to peck about at once, as though being hatched three hundred years too late was just nothing. "'Glad to see you, Man Friday,' I said for I'd naturally settled he was to be called Man Friday, if he ever hatched, as soon as I found the egg in the canoe had developed. I was a bit anxious about his feed, so I gave him a lump of raw parrot fish at once. He took it and opened his beak for more. I was glad about that, because under the circumstances, if he'd been at all fussy, I should have had to eat him after all. And he grew. You could almost see him grow and as I was never a very social man, his quiet, friendly ways suited me to a T. For nearly two years, we were as happy as we could be on that island. I had no business worries, because I knew my salary was mounting up at Dawson's. We would see a sail now and then, but nothing ever came near us. I amused myself, too, by decorating the island with designs made from sea urchins and fancy shells of various kinds. I put Apiornis Island all around the place very nearly, in big letters like what you see done with coloured stones at railway stations in the old country, and mathematical calculations and drawings of various sorts. And I used to lie watching that bloody bird stalking around and growing, growing, and I'd think about how I could make a living out of him by showing him about if I ever got taken off that atoll. After his first molt he began to get handsome with a crest and a blue wattle and a lot of green feathers at his behind, and then I used to puzzle whether Dawson's had any right to claim him or not. During stormy weather and in the rainy season we lay snug under the shelter I'd made out of the old canoe, and I used to tell him lies about my friends back home. And after a storm we would go round the island together to see if there was any driftwood. It was a kind of idyll, you might say. If only I'd had some tobacco, it would have been simply just like heaven. It was about the end of the second year our little paradise went wrong. Friday was then about fourteen feet high from toe to beak, with a broad head like the end of a pickaxe, and two huge brown eyes with yellow rims, set together like a man's, not out of sight of each other like a hen's. His plumage was fine, 
None of the half morning style of your ostrich, more like a cassowary as far as colour and texture go. And that was when he started to act arrogantly and kind of show off in front of me and show signs of a nasty temper. And at last came a time when my fishing had been rather unlucky and he began to hang about me in an odd meditative way. I thought he might have been eating sea cucumbers or something, but it was really just discontent on his part. I was hungry too, and when I finally landed a fish I wanted it for myself. Tempers were short that morning on both sides. He pecked at it and grabbed it, and I gave him a whack on the head to make him let go, and after that he went for me. God! He gave me this in the face. The man pointed to his scar. Then he kicked me. It was like a cart horse. I got up and seeing that he hadn't finished, ran off at full tilt with my arms doubled up over my face. But he ran on those gawky legs of his faster than a racehorse and kept striking out at me with sledgehammer kicks and bringing his pickaxe down on the back of my head. I made for the lagoon and went in up to my neck. He stopped at the water because he hated getting his feet wet and started to make a big fuss somewhat resembling a peacock's display but with a harsher tone. He started strutting up and down the beach. I'll admit I felt pretty small to see this fossil lording it over me. And my head and face were all bleeding and, well, my body just one jelly of bruises. I decided to swim across the lagoon and leave him alone for a bit until the whole thing blew over. I shinned up the tallest palm tree and sat there thinking about it all. I don't suppose I ever felt so hurt by anything before or since. It was the brutal ingratitude of the creature. I'd been more than a brother to him, a great gawky out-of-date bird, and me a human being, heir of the ages and all that. I thought after a time he'd begin to see things in that light himself and feel a little sorry for his behaviour. I thought if I was to catch some nice little bits of fish, perhaps, and then go to him in a casual kind of way and offer them to him, he might do the sensible thing. It took me some time to learn how spiteful and bad-tempered an extinct bird can be. Pure malice. I won't tell you all the little tricks I tried to win that bird round again. I simply can't. It makes my cheek burn with shame even now to think of the snubs and buffets I had from this infernal curiosity. I tried violence. I chucked lumps of coral at him from a safe distance, but he only swallowed them. I threw my open knife at him and almost lost it, though it was too big for him to swallow. I tried starving him out and stuck to fishing for myself but he took to picking along the beach at low water after worms and got by on that. Half my time I spent up to my neck in the lagoon and the rest up the palm trees. One of them was hardly even high enough and when he caught me up it he had a regular bank holiday with the calves of my legs. It got unbearable. I don't know if you've ever tried sleeping up a palm tree. It gave me the most horrible nightmares Think of the shame of it too. Here was this extinct animal stalking about my island like a sulky duke and me not allowed to rest the sole of my foot on the place. I used to cry with weariness and frustration. I told him straight that I didn't mean to be chased about a desert island by any damned anachronisms. I told him to go and peck someone his own age. But he only snapped his beak at me, great ugly bird, all legs and neck. I wouldn't like to say how long that went on in total. I would have killed him sooner if I'd known how. But eventually I hit on a way of dealing with him at last. It's an old South American trick. I joined all my fishing lines together with stems of seaweed and things and made a kind of tough string, perhaps 12 yards in length or more, and I fastened two lumps of coral rock to the ends of this. It took me some time to do it, because every now and then I had to go into the lagoon or up a tree when he came by. Eventually I had it ready, a kind of roughly assembled bowler. This I whirled rapidly round my head and then let it go at him. The first time I missed, 
but the next time the string caught his legs beautifully and wrapped round them again and again. Over he went. I threw it standing waist deep in the lagoon, and as soon as he went down I was out of the water and sawing at his neck with my knife. I don't like to think of that even now. I felt like a murderer while I did it, though my anger was hot against him. When I stood over him and saw him bleeding on the white sand, and his beautiful great legs and neck writhing in his last agony, it broke my heart. With that tragedy, loneliness came upon me like a curse. Good Lord, you can't imagine how I missed that bird. I sat by his corpse and sorrowed over him and shivered as I looked round the desolate, silent reef. I thought of what a jolly little bird he'd been when he was hatched and of a thousand pleasant tricks he'd played before he went wrong. I thought if I'd only wounded him I might have nursed him round into a better understanding. If I'd had any means of digging into the coral rock I would have buried him. I felt exactly as if he was human. As it was I couldn't think of eating him so I put him in the lagoon and the little fishes picked him clean. I didn't even save the feathers. Then one day a chap cruising about in a yacht took it upon himself to see if my atoll still existed. He didn't come a moment too soon for I was about sick enough of the desolation of it and only hesitating whether I should walk out into the sea and be done with it all that way or fall back on the green things. I sold the bones to a man named Winslow a dealer near the British Museum, and he says he sold them to old Havers. It seems Havers didn't understand they were extra large, and it was only after his death that they attracted attention. They called them Apionis, what was it? Apionis Vastus, I said. It's funny, the very thing was mentioned to me by a friend of mine. When they found an Apionis with a thigh a yard long, they thought they'd reached the top of the scale and called him Apionis Maximus. Then someone turned up another thigh bone, four feet six or more, and that they called Apionis Titan. Then your Vastus was found after old Havers died in his collection, and then a Vastissimus turned up. Yes, Winslow told me the same thing, said the man with the scar. If they get any more Apionises, he reckons some top scientist will go and burst a blood vessel. But it was a strange thing to happen to a man, wasn't it, altogether? Okay, that's the end of the story. All right, <laughs> how was that? How was that, listeners? I really hope that my performance did the story justice. It's quite a difficult one to read out, considering like how much I enjoy the story, how much I love the story, and how much I enjoyed it when I first read it. I really wanted to get that across to you. I hope that you were able to follow it. I hope I did a decent job of reading it out. And... At this point, I mean, I don't really quite know what to say at the end of the story. I think I need to go through it and explain it in more detail, right? That's what I definitely need, need to do that. But th these are some notes I wrote earlier. I said, I wrote this. I don't know what to say at the end of that, except that I just find it to be such a vivid tale and so ironic to find yourself in such an extraordinary situation where you're being hunted by an animal that by all rights should never have existed or should never exist, shouldn't exist, that all rights shouldn't, shouldn't even exist, right? Back from extinction, but its primal nature, the primal nature of this bird took precedence over everything else. And it's exactly the sort of thing that would happen in nature, basically a bird or an animal growing through its infancy in its juvenile stage and then becoming an adult and then changing and becoming like aggressive and violent and actually wanting to eat you if it's bigger than you so it's the sort of thing that would happen in nature but humans are not very used to it happening uh, to us these days as we're rarely knocked off the top of the pecking order so just like an ironic the irony of being knocked from the top of the pecking order by uh, what should be an extinct animal and I know some of you are kind of thinking this is ridiculous there's no way that that could happen that eggs that are hundreds of years old that could actually <laughs> hatch and that is obviously the little twist right that's the that's where he's pushed it into the realm of fiction 
I mean, not exactly science fiction, but it's kind of pushed into the realm of fantasy at that point. And you just, I suppose, have to go with it. Um, right. And if you're willing to go with it and just imagine what would actually happen if you found some eggs that were per perfectly preserved to the point where they were still actually the, 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 the embryo or the, the eggs were still um, fertile and could still actually um, hatch. What would happen if, if you got stuck on a desert island with one of those birds? I don't know, I, f I just found that to be a really imaginative and evocative story, but also terribly sad. I actually find it so terribly sad, especially the moment when he had to kill the bird. It's a heart heartbreaking moment. But yes, it was a strange thing to happen to a man. And by the way, this story was written a hundred years before Jurassic Park, by the way. Okay, so what I need to do now is go through that story again because the, I can easily imagine that a lot of things were not clear to you. Um, how was that? Did you understand everything? Were there things that you couldn't really follow? Um, I mean, I know the story well because I've read it a few times now, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were things you didn't understand. Like, for example, how did he get rescued? Because in the story he refers to the man who rescues him he only briefly mentions him at the end. He says a chap. Um, a chap. He, des he describes him as a chap, which is a, a another word for a man. So it's it's not. It wasn't that clearly stated. Like a man came and rescued me. It was something like a chap took it upon himself to see if my atoll still existed, which basically means that a man came by in a boat, uh, exploring the area to see if this island was there. And that's when um, Butcher was discovered and rescued. So let me go through the story again. And this time I'm going to explain a lot of details. This could take some time, but that's all right. Um, let's get stuck into it then. So Apionis Island by H.G. Wells, vocab, explanations and uh, details coming. This is going to take ages. Let's go. So. The man with the scarred face leant over the table and looked at the bundle of flowers I'd collected. So the man with the scarred face, his face was scarred. He had a scar on his face, right? A scar. If you if you get cut, if your face or any other part of your body gets cut, for example, cut with a knife, or in this case, cut by the beak of a big elephant bird that, that's, that pecks you in the face, if your face or any other part of your body gets cut, uh, it heals, and then afterwards, you will probably get a scar there. For example, I've got a scar on my leg from when I was playing football as a kid and I, I was goalkeeping. I dived on the ground to catch the ball and I think there was a sharp stone in the ground and it cut my leg open really badly and I've still got a scar there now. So I've got a scarred leg. In this case, the man with the scarred face. So the man with the scar on his face. He leant over the table. He leant over. This is the verb uh, lean to lean over the table. That's, he sort of like um, moved his body forwards in order to start talking uh, to someone. He leant over the table. Lean, to lean over, move your body over, uh, lean over. He leant over the table and looked at the bundle of flowers I'd collected. A bundle of flowers, just like a group of flowers all gathered together. You have a bunch of flowers. A bunch of flowers would be what you would buy from the florist. You'd give a bunch of flowers to your girlfriend or, or someone that you love, you know. Uh, you bring them a bunch of flowers. A bundle of flowers suggests that it's like a, a big group of flowers that he's collected. It might not be uh, tied up together and presented in a beautiful way. That would be a bunch of flowers, a bundle of flowers, just a, a, a load of flowers that he collected. Orchids, he asked. A few, I said. Cepropediums, he said. So this is obviously the name of a kind of orchid. Cepropediums, he said. Uh, mostly, I replied. Anything new? No, I thought not. I did these islands 25, 27 years ago. If you find anything new here, well, it's brand new. I didn't leave much. So here Butcher is describing how, um, it, you know, it seems that Butcher has already explored all these islands and um, has found all of the different flora and fauna, all the different... Uh, plant life and animal life that exists here. So he's done them. He's kind of like found all the new, he's, he's, he's um, 
recorded all of the different species. Uh, I did these islands 25, 27 years ago. If you find anything new here, well, it's brand new. I didn't leave much. The, the character Butcher is quite an interesting character. You get the impression that he's sort of one of these really old school people, a kind of very tough, matter of fact type of person. I mean, a real survivor, there's no doubt. But also maybe a little arrogant. Yes, I did these islands 25, 27 years ago. If you find anything new here, well, it's brand new. I didn't leave much. I've done all of this already. You know, he's a little bit full of himself, maybe. Uh, I'm not a collector, I said. I was young then, he went on. My goodness, how I used to fly around. So this butcher character starts to remember his, his younger days. How I used to fly around meaning he used to travel around to places very quickly. Going here, going there, going around, flying around, traveling around, you know, quite quickly. Never staying in one place for too long. He seemed to measure me with his eyes. So this is an interesting line in the story. I'm wondering why Wells puts this line in here. It's as if Butcher is looking at the narrator briefly quick having a quick look at him as if he's sort of like judging taking his measure why would butcher do that i don't know he's sort of like having a look as if to as, as if he's thinking hmm i wonder if i can wonder who this chap is shall i tell him my story or maybe uh, i think i could probably uh make him believe this story or I, i'm not sure why uh Butcher measures the narrator with his eyes. He just looks at him and maybe sort of like quickly makes a judgment about him. Yes, who is this young chap? I think I'll tell him my story. He'll probably be impressed by it. I was in the East Indies two years. The East Indies, this is um, the Caribbean, right? East Indies, various, oh no, the West Indies is the Caribbean. The East Indies is the, a term used in historical narratives of the Age of Discovery. The Indies broadly refers to various lands in the East or the Eastern Hemisphere, including the, including the islands and mainlands found in and around the Indian Ocean by Portuguese explorers soon after the Cape Route was discovered. So, right, the Malay Archipelago, the Philippine Archipelago, Indian, Indonesian Archipelago, Borneo, New Guinea... That's what used to be called the East Indies, right? I was in the East Indies two years and seven in Brazil. Then I went to Madagascar. So Butcher is explaining how he's been to all these various places in the world. I know a few explorers by name, I said, anticipating a story. Who did you collect for? So this is what the narrator says to Butcher. The butcher, uh, the narrator is anticipating a story. So anticipating, expecting one to happen, right? Sort of like if you anticipate something, you sort of imagine that something's going to happen before it happens. So the narrator's like, hmm, I bet this butcher character is going to tell me a story. Uh, so he says, I know a few explorers by name. Who did you collect for? So he's like asking for more information, uh, allowing butcher to perhaps tell a story. Dawson's. So Dawson's would be the collect, uh, the collector or the company that Butcher was uh, working for, Dawson's. And Butcher says, I wonder if you've ever heard the name Butcher. Butcher, Butcher. Um, the name seemed vaguely familiar. If something's vaguely familiar, it means it's like, mm, I think I know that. Like if, if it's familiar, it means you feel like you know it or you've already heard it. Um, if it's vaguely familiar, it's a nice collocation. Those two words often go together. Oh, it's vaguely familiar. It's like, mm, you feel like you've heard the name before. It seems like you've heard it before. Yeah, it seems kind of vaguely familiar to me. I'm not sure. I'm, it rings a bell. Then I remembered Butcher versus Dawson. So Butcher versus Dawson or Butcher v. Dawson. This, is a, this would be a legal case, right? A case in the legal courts. A legal case. You know, when, whenever you talk about uh, cases of law, it's always someone versus someone, right? Uh, particularly if it's a, a private uh, case, um, right? I mean, you know, typically if it's a divorce, 
you hear about like a Smith versus Smith would be a divorce case or the people versus Smith that would be in the USA a criminal case where it's the the, the state prosecuting uh, someone called Smith in this case it's Butcher versus Dawson so Butcher the employee of the company and Dawson I guess the the company or the person who owned the company it seems that Daw uh, Butcher and Dawson were involved in a legal dispute that went to court court is the place where legal cases are heard there's a judge there are lawyers right that's in a court so the butcher versus dawson clearly this case went to court ha, uh, this and the the narrator of the story remembers this court case it must have been famous it must have been in the newspapers or something wow i said you're the man who sued them for four years salary you got cast away on a desert island so butcher must have sued dawson for four years salary because he was cast away on this desert island while working for Dawson. Dawson, the company, had sent Butcher out to collect these remains of the Apionis, looking for bones, looking for eggs. He was employed by Dawson at the time, and while um, being employed by him, he got uh, stranded on this desert island. So I suppose Butcher argued that Dawson was liable, right, that they were still responsible for him, and they still owed him a salary because he was still essentially under contract even though he was stuck on an island um he was still being um you know employed by dawson's at the time and so they should have been paying him for the entire experience which i can understand right i mean why not why shouldn't dawson's continue to pay him salary dawson's probably thought he was dead you know they probably assumed that he was dead or gone and argued that they it, it wasn't their responsibility to to continue paying him so i think that uh butcher won the case it seems that Butcher won the case. You're the man who sued them for four years' salary. So it looks like he got the money. To sue someone means to take someone to court. For example, if you feel like you've got a claim to make, for example, if you feel like your employer owes you four years of salary, uh, you would take them to court. You would sue them, right? Um, At your service, said the man with the scar, bowing. At your service, this is a, a kind of a, something that... People say, meaning, uh, you know, I'm at your service, meaning I am your servant. Um, a kind of a, a funny, uh, modest thing to say when um, you're in someone's company. Oh, you're, you're, you're Luke Thompson, aren't you? At your service. It's a, people don't say that anymore. It's kind of an old-fashioned thing. But meaning, yes, I am, I'm here to serve you. Meaning, I'm, I'm, it's like a generous, friendly thing to say. At your service, said the man with the scar, bowing. If you bow, it means you lean forwards, right? Like, um, you know, like typically in Japan, people bow a lot. Hey, you're not going to go to mass. Like sort of bowing, right? Uh, you, if you meet the king, you bow to the queen. Or if you're a girl, you curtsy. Right, so at your service, said the man with the scar, bowing, leaning his head forwards. Funny case, wasn't it? So a case, in this case, it was um, Butcher versus Dawson's. That's a legal case. But a case can also just be a, a situation. Funny case, wasn't it? Here was me making a little fortune on that island. So Butcher was making a fortune. If you make a fortune, it means you make a lot of money. A fortune is a, is a lot of money. In this case, he was being paid a lot of money, you know, four years by Dawson's. Um, here was me making a little fortune, making lots of money on that island, doing nothing for it. So he wasn't even doing anything. He was just you know, living on the island. And them, that's Dawson's, the company, quite unable to fire me. So Dawson's couldn't fire him. To fire him, to fire someone, means to um, dismiss them. So, for example, if, if, if I'm your boss, right, and you do something wrong at work, like, I don't know, you're stealing pens from the pen cupboard, which is obviously a terrible crime, I'd warn you, right, stop stealing pens. I've caught you stealing pens once. And then, you know, you've got two more warnings and then you get, you know, I catch you stealing pens again. And then a third time, you, um, I say, right, that's it. That's, that's your final warning. I'm sorry, but you're fired. Um, and the, uh, you, you get your coat. You've got to go. Sorry, you're fired. To be fired, to be dismissed means that you, your employer tells you that you have to leave your job. So they, he was on the island 
making money from Dawson's and they couldn't fire him. They couldn't dismiss him because obviously they didn't know where he was. It off and the story continues. It often used to amuse me, used to sort of make me laugh. Thinking it over, thinking if you think something over, it's like you think about it again and again and again. You sort of like uh, consider it, um, right? Right, sort of, yeah, thinking it over, thinking it, thinking about it again and again, thinking about it deeply. It used to amuse me thinking it over while I was there. I did calculations of it. So he did the, the, all the maths. He did all the, the calculations like you would normally do these days with the calculator. One plus one is two, right? That's a, a, a sort of calculation, a very simple one. But he did calculations of it all over that damned atoll written in the sand. So he was doing the mathematical calculations, working out how much money uh, Dawson's uh, had to pay him. And he was doing the calculations, writing, writing all the numbers in the sand all over that damned atoll. So an atoll, this word, you've heard this word a few times. An atoll is a certain kind of island. And it's normally, I think, an island made from, a, from coral or it's, um, it's part of a coral reef. Coral is a kind of... Um, it's a sort of, uh, it's a living thing which grows in the water. Um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia is a coral reef, right? Um, so an atoll is often made of coral or it's based in coral, or it could be, also I understand, it could be as a result of volcanic activity. But basically an atoll is a very small island in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the ocean, and often an atoll has a kind of a basin in the middle or a lagoon in the middle, um, like water in the center of it. And if it's made from a, um, if it's actually made from volcanic activity, there might be rock there with coral on top of it, and there might also be spring water, natural drinkable water that comes up through it because of the volcanic, you know, because it's essentially a volcano, the very top part of a volcano or an ancient volcano. So you get a ring of, of, um, of land with possibly uh, fresh water somewhere and a lagoon in the middle, a kind of lake in the middle that probably has lots of fish in it. So that's an atoll. It's a sort of an island with a lake in the middle. So he did calculations all over that damned atoll. That damned is a slightly old-fashioned word to express uh, the fact that he, you know, he, he's frustrated with this island. He hates the island. These days, you might say that bloody atoll, or you might use the F word, that fucking atoll, right, to express frustration with something. So like, you know, it's old-fashioned language, but I might say, if my phone's not working, it's like, I just can't get this damned phone to work. Or I can't get this bloody phone to work, is what I might say these days. Might get, I can't get this stupid phone to work. I can't get this fucking phone to work. That would be the F word, which is obviously very rude. Um, How did it happen, I said. I don't quite remember the case. Well, you've heard of the Apionis, haven't you? Yes, I have. My colleague Andrews was telling me of a new species he was working on only a month or so ago. So the narrator has heard of the Apionis. His colleague, who apparently is a scientist or an explorer or something like that, Andrews was telling him about a new species of Apionis that he was working on recently, just before I sailed. This is when, when he heard about the Apionis. They've got a thigh bone, it seems, nearly a yard long. So Andrews and the other scientists, um, researchers or whatever, have got a bone, in this case a thigh bone. So the thigh bone is a bone from the leg. It's the upper part of the leg probably the largest, one of the largest bones in the body, okay? Um, so your thigh is from your waist to your knee. That's your thigh. So the thigh bone is the largest bone in your body, I think. So um, it's probably the same case for the Apionis. Uh, they've got a thigh bone, it seems, nearly a yard long. A yard is um, an imper it's imperial measurement. You've got, you know, inches, feet, and yards, and miles. This is imperial. Uh, and um, what is a yard? How many, how, f how big is a yard? So a yard is just under a meter, okay? A yard is about 91 centimeters. Okay, so they've, 
the narrator is saying that Andrews and his other colleagues found a thigh bone or they've been studying a thigh bone which is nearly nearly a yard long so it's like sort of just under a meter long or so the thing must have been an absolute monster right i believe you said the man with the scar it was a monster but when did they get hold of these bones three or four years ago 91 i think why why because i found them goodness me it's nearly 20 years ago so uh butcher yes the the the, the bones that uh the, the narrator's colleague Andrews has been studying were actually found by Butcher himself. Might have even been the, the bones of the actual bird on the island, but we don't know. Um, anyway, he found them, 91, in, in 1891, nearly 20 years ago. If Dawson's hadn't been silly about that salary, they might have made a fortune. So, because Dawson's um, didn't want to pay him the salary, they didn't get to uh, keep the, the bones and they didn't get to sell them, which was a mistake. Um, anyway, I just couldn't stop the infernal boat going adrift. So uh, Butcher here is sort of remembering the experience of being stuck on the boat. I couldn't stop the infernal boat going adrift. Infernal, it's another word like damned, bloody. It's an old-fashioned one, though. Infernal relates to hell. So it's like the hellish boat, that damned boat. Infernal, damned. These are both sort of like religious um, um, swear words, but old-fashioned ones. Um, these days, religious swear words are not really quite as offensive as they used to be. Um, so anyway, I couldn't stop the bloody boat going adrift. I couldn't stop the infernal boat going adrift. Going adrift. Adrift. So a boat, if it's left on the water without an anchor, without being attached to the uh, bottom of the sea, to the seabed, right, without being attached to something, the boat will drift, okay? It will drift, and it will go adrift. Adrift is the adjective then, right? So the boat drifts, and the boat goes adrift, right? So that he's talking about the way he couldn't stop the boat from drifting. He paused. I suppose it's the same place, a kind of swamp about 90 miles north of Antananarivo. Do you happen to know? You have to go to it along the coast by boats. You don't happen to remember, perhaps. So he's referring to the place where um, he found the bones and the eggs. A kind of swamp. So the swamp, I told you about that at the beginning of the episode, an area where there's a lot of water in the earth and... Um, it's it's the ground is very very wet and not solid at all and you can things can sink down into the swamp right so this is the place where um he found the bones about 90 miles north of antananarivo antananarivo is a place in madagascar um he says you have to go uh, go to it along the coast by boats so the only way to get there is to go around the coast you can't go th through the land because presumably it's just inaccessible there are too many swamps or the land is just not you can't travel through the land you have to go around around the coast in boats to access it um he says you don't happen to remember so instead of saying you don't remember do you this is quite nice you don't happen to remember it's just a, a sort of little hedging phrase that we use in order to be a bit less direct and we use this happen to you sorry happen to we use that a lot today so, for example, you don't happen to know where you don't happen to know where the station is, do you? So you could say, "Where's the station?" which is too direct. Do you know where the station is? which is less direct. You don't know where the station is, do you? which is again less direct and more polite. And then you don't happen to know where the station is, do you? And also you can have by any chance. You don't happen to know where the station is by any chance, do you? Right, so happen to is just one of those little phrases we use to we use to make our questions less direct and more polite. You don't happen to remember, perhaps. I don't, but I'm pretty sure Andrew said something about a swamp. It must be the same place. So um, Butcher is is convinced that um, these bones have come from the same place that uh, that he where he was exploring before. It must be the same place. It's on the east coast. 
somehow there's something in the swamp water that stops things from decaying. So um, decaying means, you know, as things get old, they decay, they start to break down. Like, for example, if you have, you eat an apple, you throw the apple core, the bit in the middle that you didn't eat, you throw that um, into, uh, you throw that on the ground, right, in the, in the countryside, you're walking through the forest, having a nice walk, eating an apple, you throw the apple core on the ground, the apple core will, will land on the ground and slowly it will decay until eventually it's just broken down completely and just become part of the earth. So to decay. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like break down, get old and start to kind of decompose as bacteria eats it away and fungus eats it away. Right. So there's something in the swamp water that stops things from decaying. So it keeps things, it preserves things. Things in the water, they, they get preserved. And this is true, this is real. We know that there are kind of like oil pits or, or tar pits, these swamps, deep, deep swamps full of this kind of oily earth. And um, many, many old, ancient, um, extinct uh, species have been discovered in these pits. And this is, we know this is true. Dinosaur bones, dinosaur skeletons and other things have been removed from the tar pits. So presumably the animals went into the swamp and, and didn't survive. They couldn't get out and they sunk down into the swamp water um, or something like that. And then they, their bodies were perfectly preserved by this oily stuff that's in, that was in there. Um, it, it smells like creosote. Creosote is a sort of, um, what is creosote? yellow yellowish greasy liquid with a smoky odor it's a sort of an oily liquid okay it's so the the water in this swamp stops things from decaying it smells like creosote it reminded me of trinidad which is an island in the caribbean did they get any more eggs some of the eggs i found were a foot and a half long so we had a a, a yard is about 90 centimeters a foot a foot is, is 30 centimetres, yeah, of course. A foot, um, a foot is 30 centimetres. So a foot and a half, that's about 45 centimetres long. Some of the eggs I found were a foot and a half long, about 45 centimetres. The swamp goes circling round, you know, and cuts off this bit. So the swamp goes circling round. The, he's describing the shape of the swamp and the way it, it curves round and cuts off a certain area. If an area is cut off, it means it's inaccessible. You can't get to it. For example, like in some places near the seaside, when the tide comes in, when the water comes in at high tide, um, the water actually will cut off certain places. Like there's a there's a place in in uh, on the northern coast of France called Mont Saint Michel. It's a famous place. There's a kind of a castle there, or there's a little town, in fact, on a on a hill. And um, it's out across the sand. And when the high tide comes in, the, the island gets cut off from the mainland. So in this case, this swamp goes round and cuts off another part of the, of the land. He says it's mostly salt too. Well, what a time I had. I found the things quite by accident. We went for eggs, me and two native chaps, in one of those funny canoes all tied together and found the bones at the same time. So Butcher is talking about how he went there looking for, um, looking for eggs and they found the bones while they were looking for the eggs. And he went there with two native chaps. I suppose that's two local men um, from Madagascar, right? Um, I mean, this is, this is in... This is in the old, old days. Um, I don't know what the arrangement would have been with these two native chaps. I don't know how much, you know, how much he was paying them, if he indeed he was paying them at all. Hopefully some sort of payment, of course. But anyway, uh, he had these two native chaps with him that were working for him. Uh, and they went in one of those funny canoes. A canoe is a sort of a long little boat that you can... You know, you can imagine canoeing. You have a you have a paddle in your hand. You can you can paddle on one side. You can paddle on the other side. It's kind of long. You could you know 
paddle up a river or something like that. You can have individual kayak canoes where you've got a double paddle on both sides and you can, you know, paddle like that. That's a, a long, slim boat that fits one person or, in this case, if it's a very long canoe, you can get a few people in there. So in one of those funny canoes all tied together, so it's probably a, some canoe that's a locally made canoe tied together, and f they found the bones at the same time while looking for the eggs. We had a tent and provisions for four days. Provisions, just basically things to eat for four days. And we pitched on one of the firmer places. Um, pitched, they pitched the, the tent. So you pitch a tent. That means just put up your tent. So you're hiking in the countryside, you find a good flat uh, spot and you pitch your tent. So you, you put up the tent uh, on one of the firmer places. Firm, uh, firm is like the opposite of soft in terms of the ground. Some parts of the ground would be a bit too soft, a bit too swampy. You can't pitch a tent there. So they found one of the firmer places, a place where the earth, the ground was a bit was more firm, was more solid where they could put their tent. They pitched their tent on one of the firmer places. Thinking of it brings that old tarry smell back to me even now. So thinking about it reminds him of the, the smell of the tar. So we know, we know what oil is, right? But tar is like oil. It's kind of thicker than oil. Uh, they typically use tar uh, when they are making roads, okay? Um, when making roads. Uh, I'm not really an engineer, so I'm well, not really, I'm not an engineer at all. Uh, so I don't know exactly how roads are made, but uh, as far as I understand, it's like kind of gravel or something mixed with this thick, oily stuff that that's tar and it goes onto the road and that can, that ends up being the, the tarmac that covers the road. When uh, someone smokes a cigarette, uh, the filter at the end goes all orange, and that orange is, is due to the tar that builds up in the filter. And of course, in people's lungs, smokers end up with tar that collects in their lungs. Okay, so that's tar. So thinking of this place reminds him of the tarry smell. So tar is the noun, tarry would be the adjective. Thinking of it brings that old tarry smell back to me even now. It's funny work. You go probing into the mud with iron rods probing. So you've got these long iron rods, these long pieces of iron, right? So rods, you would also use rods to build a tent. These are the poles, thin, thin poles. So in this case, they're using these long metal rods to probe into the swamp. Probing is like putting something out, or put, in this case, putting something down and into the swamp in order to look around, in order to find something probing, sort of pushing something out into an unknown place in order to look for something. We send probes into space, right? These are like um, um, deep space probes. It would be like a sort of a, a spacecraft of some kind that goes far out into space and it sends back information about what it finds, you know, and they take pictures of Jupiter or something like that. That's a deep space probe. In this case, they were probing into the mud so basically putting these long metal poles down into the mud, looking for what was in there, looking for the bones, probing. Usually the egg gets smashed. So naturally, if you're probing in the earth with big iron rods and there's, a, there's an egg in there, then the egg's probably going to get smashed most of the time. So it's probably, it's extremely difficult, like extremely difficult to recover a perfectly preserved egg from, these, from a, a swamp like this. I wonder how long it is since these Apionises really lived. The missionaries say the locals have legends about when they were alive, but I never heard any such stories myself. The missionaries, missionaries were people like Christians who went out to places like this in order to convert people, in order to set up, set up missions, churches, to convert the local people to Christianity. You know, and famously there were missionaries that went uh, to South America, uh, you know, South, Central and South America and, and so on. In this case, it looks like the missionaries went to Madagascar. So these are people who went out uh, in order to, you know, convert the local people to Christianity. The missionaries say the locals have legends 
about when they were alive. Legends, old stories. Are they true? Are they not true? Um, so old, old stories. Uh, but I, I never heard any such stories myself. But certainly those eggs we got were as fresh as if they'd just been laid. Right? Just been laid. Lay, laid, laid. To lay an egg. Right? Birds lay eggs. That's when the egg comes out, right? <laughs> I don't think it makes that noise when it happens. I'd be surprised. I mean, I've never worked on a chicken farm, so I don't know if that's what it's like every night. Oh, going to bed. Oh, I wonder if there's, how many eggs we're going to get in the morning. Oh, all night. You know, oh, I counted 19 eggs last night. I don't think that's how it works. But anyway, you get the idea. When an egg comes out, uh, that's, we, we call that laying an egg. So uh, the eggs were as fresh as if they'd just been laid. Now, at this point, obviously, uh, this is where the sort of the fantasy element comes in. H.G. Wells was a was uh, someone who, to an extent, created the genre of science fiction. This is where you take sort of scientific principles, scientific ideas, like the f the fact that <clears throat> these sorts of explorations genuinely happened. People genuinely found these eggs and bones and things. We take those facts, so it's based on science, and just push it a little further. Like, what if? What if they did find eggs and they found one that was still alive, still fertile? So these, these eggs were, were, were as if they'd just been laid. They were still fresh. You have to use, to really go with the story, <clears throat> you have to use, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Because, you know, you might be thinking, oh, that's impossible. Sorry, can't, can't enjoy this. Just impossible. Well, of course, you've got to have a little bit of suspension of disbelief. It takes a little bit of imagination and just a little bit of fun, let's say, to uh, then imagine what could happen. Same thing with Jurassic Park. The idea is, you know, the scientific principle is that, sure, you could find mosquitoes that have been perfectly preserved in amber, and you could drill into that amber, and you could extract the DNA from the blood in the, in the body of the mosquito, the blood that that mosquito has just sucked out of, this, out of the body of a dinosaur. You could get the DNA from that blood, and you could then genetically engineer, uh, you could reverse engineer the actual dinosaur from that DNA and then you've got dinosaurs, and then you've got a dinosaur park, and then you've got the dinosaurs escaping the dinosaur park, and it's a, you know, a thrilling film. Same level of suspension of disbelief is, is necessary, and it's the same kind of principle of science fiction, where something is based on science with a little, little push of imagination. So the eggs were as fresh as, if they, as when they'd just been laid. Fresh! Carrying them down to the boat, one of my local chaps dropped one on a rock and it smashed. I was absolutely furious, I can tell you. So while they were carrying these three eggs, these precious eggs, down to the boat, one of the local guys dropped one on a rock and it smashed. So, you know, these are priceless eggs. Now, you know, you could argue that the eggs should just be left where they are. Maybe, you know, maybe they should just be left there. Maybe these native guys shouldn't even be doing this. Maybe the butcher, maybe butcher is a bad guy. Maybe butcher is someone who is he's going to this place that is not his home. He's going to this, this uh, place that, who knows, maybe in the local culture, this could be a sacred place. It could be a holy place. We don't know. He's persuaded these local guys somehow to come and work for him. He might not be treating them very well. Uh, and one of them drops one of the, 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 the eggs and it smashes. And Butcher is absolutely furious because obviously the egg is, is worth a lot of money. He says, I couldn't contain myself. Well, it's not just that the egg was worth a lot of money. The egg was just extremely rare, like priceless, really. Um, certainly today, if you know, a, a, a perfectly preserved Apionis egg would certainly be a priceless thing. And it, you know, you, I think they have them in the British Museum or the Natural History Museum. I'm sure they're priceless. You know, you, priceless means you can't put a price on it. They're just too valuable. Um, I was absolutely furious. I couldn't contain myself, meaning I, I, he couldn't contain himself. He couldn't control himself. He couldn't keep his anger inside. He, and he said, and I gave him a bit of a beating, I have to say. So that means he, he physically assaulted him. So he hit him. 
probably slapped him around the head or punched him or something. Which is cruel, you know, definitely cruel behaviour, completely unacceptable. But that's what he did. I gave him a bit of a beating. I mean, if there was any justice, Butcher would be taken to court <laughs> uh, for that. But anyway, I gave him a bit of a beating, I have to say. The egg was perfect. Fresh as the day it was laid, not even smelly. And its mother dead for 400 years, perhaps. Probably longer. I mean, we know now, uh, I think, that, uh, that the Apionis uh, went extinct 900, 1,000 years ago, I think. Um, the assistant who dropped it said a centipede had bitten him. So a centipede is a kind of... It's not an insect. It's a creepy crawly, for sure. It's a horrible thing. Ugh. Horrible creepy crawly. They, they say centipede is technically means a hundred legs, but they don't have a hundred legs. So a centipede is a long thing with lots and lots of legs. They crawl around. You might find them in the, in the ground. In Madagascar, they probably have very big ones and they can bite. Some centipedes can bite and some centipedes are poisonous if they bite. So kind of a long, um, creepy crawly. Um, ugh, you're not going to want to see a picture of one. Centipedes are elongated, uh, segmented creatures with one pair of legs per body segment. All centipedes are venomous and can inflict painful stings. Not all, I'm sure that not all those, not all uh, centipedes can, can uh, hurt humans though. Only some of them. Anyway, that's centipedes. Oh, yuck, makes your skin crawl just looking at it. So the, the guy who dropped the egg said that a centipede had bitten him. And Butcher continues, however, I'm getting sidetracked from the story. It had taken us all day to dig into the sludge. Sludge is... Oh, by the way, I'm getting sidetracked, meaning I'm getting distracted. I'm talking about something else. He said, it had taken us all day to dig into the sludge. The sludge is like the mud, the, the, the sort of soft, liquidy, um, uh, muddy stuff in the ground. He's calling it sludge. Okay. Just trying to think of other kinds of sludge. I can't think of any other kinds of sludge at the moment, but just a kind of muddy, uh, liquidy, slimy, swampy, earthy stuff. Right. It took us all day to dig us in, dig into the sludge and get these eggs out unbroken. And we were all covered with disgusting black mud. And naturally I was cross. Cross means angry. I mean, you would be, it sounds like horrible work. It sounds like absolutely horrible work. Ugh, just, I mean, you know, working in the garden for me when, it, when I'm back at my parents' house, if they want me to like do some digging in the garden, I mean, that's, that's frustrating enough because you get all hot and sweaty and it's quite uncomfortable and you get mud all over your, your hands and your, your feet and stuff, you know, hand, you, you just, it's pretty dirty, disgusting work. But being all the way out there, miles away from civilization, um, on a little canoe, digging into this oily swamp, it must have been all hot and imagine all the insect life and oh, it must have been just so horrible uh, and covered in black mud. And then the guy drops the egg. Uh, he said, naturally, I was cross, meaning angry. As far as I knew, they were the only eggs that have ever been removed, not even cracked. I think we know what cracked means. You, you know, cracked means if you drop an egg, then it'll crack, right? The only eggs that have ever been removed, not even cracked. I went afterwards to see the ones at the Natural History Museum in London. All of them were cracked and just stuck together like a mosaic. Stuck together, meaning kind of glued together. So the ones that he saw in the Natural History Museum in London, the ones on display there, were all cracked and they had been repaired, put back together. A bit like if you drop, if you break, break a plate or a, or a cup, if you drop a cup in your house and it's your favourite cup, you might uh, stick it together, stick all the parts back together with glue. And then it looks like a mosaic. So a mosaic is like a sort of a, a work of art that's made of lots of little pieces all stuck together, like you would find on a, on a, on a, on a wall or something like that, right? So uh, 
all of the ones in the Natural History Museum were all stuck together like a mosaic, with bits missing as well. Mine were perfect, and I meant to blow them when I got back. To blow an egg. This is a way of preserving the shell of the egg. So you make a little hole at the top and another little hole at the bottom, and then you <gasps> blow, and all of the fluid from the egg comes out of the hole at the bottom, and you end up with the perfectly preserved, well, almost perfectly preserved shell. That's to blow an egg. Children at Easter time blow eggs. They take the egg, the chicken egg, and make a little hole at the bottom, another one at the top, and <laughs> blow all the fluid out, and then you've got the the um, the shell, and you can decorate the shell. So to blow an egg. I don't know how you would blow an apiorna's egg. I mean, what? How would you do that? I suppose you'd need some sort of blowing machine. Anyway, naturally, I was annoyed at the silly fool dropping three hours' work just on account of a centipede. Just on account of a centipede, just because of a centipede. I hit him about a bit. Hit him about, meaning sort of hit him lots of times. The man with the scar took out a clay pipe. So Butcher, at this point in his storytelling, takes out a pipe, which he's going to use to smoke with. And the narrator said, I placed my tobacco pouch before him. He filled up absentmindedly. I quite like this detail. It's like Butcher is like really getting into his story now. And he gets his pipe out because he's kind of going to start smoking. It's quite a pleasant idea that um, he gets the pipe out. And, the, and uh, the narrator, we don't know his name, offers his tobacco to him. He's quite happy to listen to Butcher's story. He's quite happy for him to smoke some of his tobacco. Little social moment. Um, and he filled up absent-mindedly. So Butcher is lost in his thoughts, thinking about what happened. And he's without absent-mindedly means without really thinking about it. He's taking tobacco from the pouch, from this little, maybe like a leather bag or something like that. Um, taking tobacco from it and pushing it into the end of his pipe, loading up his pipe <laughs> to start smoking from it. So I placed my tobacco pouch before him. He filled up absent-mindedly. So he filled it up without really thinking about it while his mind was somewhere else. If you do, It's a nice phrase, absent-mindedly. I did it absent-mindedly. I just did it without really thinking about it. Like, did you throw away that ticket? Did you throw away that ticket that was on the table? Oh yeah, God, I did. Sorry, I must have done it absent-mindedly. I just put it in the bin absent-mindedly. I did it, put it in the bin without really thinking about it. I was thinking about something else. So anyway, he's filling up his pipe absent-mindedly while telling the story. How about the others? Did you get those home? The other eggs? I don't remember hearing about them. Well, that's the strange part of the story. I had three others, perfectly fresh eggs. Well, we put them in the boat. And then I went up to the tent to make some coffee, leaving my two heathens down on the beach. So this is when they got the eggs back to the boat and the tent. The, the two, uh, his two native assistants have taken the three eggs down to the boat. Meanwhile, Butcher goes up, or Butcher went up to the tent to make some coffee. Heathens, he calls them two heathens. Heathens are people of no, people who don't have any Christian faith. So it's a, again a sort of a dismissive word used to refer to the fact that these are local native people. He's calling them heathens in a sort of dismissive way. You know, again, it's, you know, not a very nice way to refer to them, um, right? It's a sort of dismissive way to refer to them. But anyway, there it is. He's sort of like, um, yeah, dismissively. I, you know, I'd left my two heathens down on the beach. The one fooling about with his sting. So one of them, you clearly he must have had a sting on his um, leg. Would it be a sting? Do centipedes sting or do centipedes bite? Hmm. I mean, you know, like some animals bite, don't they? Uh, like spiders bite. Um, uh, scorpions um, sting. They have a sting in the tail. Uh, mosquitoes bite. Uh, bees and wasps sting. Uh, do, sco do centipedes bite? Centipedes will try to bite. Yeah. Centipedes actually technically bite. So it should be with his with his bite, but he's written sting here. So anyway, the two natives. One of them is fooling around with his 
with his sting, which should be bite, meaning he's kind of like looking at it, playing with it, um, maybe complaining about it. And the other one is helping him, maybe trying to remove some of the venom from it or something. Is it venom? Poison. It's venom, isn't it? It's venom from a bite. It never occurred to me that the beggar would take advantage of the peculiar position I was in to stab me in the back like that. So, meaning I never realised that this man with the bite would use this opportunity, use the position I was in, to betray me, to stab me in the back. It never occurred to me, meaning I never thought about it, the, never, the thought never came to my mind, that the beggar would take advantage of the position. The beggar, this is again a, a rude, dismissive um, sort of swear word that you can use to, to describe a person. It's old-fashioned though, we don't really use that phrase anymore. That the, that the guy, I mean it sort of means guy, but it's... A beggar is, te technically a beggar is someone who's in the street uh, asking for money, but it's um, used um, sort of um, in an illustrative way uh, to just be a dismissive uh, term, rude term for a person, right? So, you know, it never, I never thought that the guy would take advantage, meaning use the situation to his advantage, in this case, take advantage of the position I was in, the peculiar position, the strange position I was in, to stab me in the back, right? Now, it's not literally stab you with a knife, right? Not literally stab someone in the back. This is just an idiom, which means to betray someone. In this case, they are gonna, um, they're going to leave him on the island and escape with these eggs. Um, Okay, but I suppose the centipede poison and the kicking I'd given him had upset him. Just one final thing about the centipedes. They actually don't really bite. They just, their, their, their legs at the front have venom in them. So they kind of spike with the legs at the front. It's kind of called a bite, but it could equally be called a sting, to be fair. Anyway, um, so I suppose the centipede poison, poison, venom, um, and the kicking I'd given him, meaning the, the way that I'd um, like hurt him, apparently he kicked him as well, had given him, uh, uh, the kicking I'd given him had upset him. He was always a bit bad tempered and he must have persuaded the other one. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's fairly understandable that the guy would be furious, like the native who's been attacked, punched, kicked, and has been, been, um, stung or bitten by a centipede, it's, un it's understandable that he would be upset, right, and furious. Um, so maybe Butcher gets what he deserves here, right? Anyway, uh, you, you know, you can draw your own conclusions about that. But, um, so the guy who'd been bitten clearly persuaded the other one that they should steal the eggs, steal the bones, and escape in the canoe, and leave butcher on the island because they'd probably had enough of him because he was probably being mean and cruel to them making them work too hard forcing them to do things they didn't really want to do and not treating them very well and they were like look let's leave this guy here look we've got the eggs we've got the bones let's go let's just leave him here okay um because he was so angry with his centipede bite and stuff or maybe even like oh, we've got to get off this island come on look i've been bitten we've got to go just leave him here and they and off they went I remember I was sitting and smoking and boiling up the water over a little spirit lamp I used to take on these expeditions. So he's there smoking his pipe probably uh, and boiling some water on a little spirit lamp. This is like a little, um, uh, you know, a little um, a cooker or something, a lamp, which is, I guess, for uh, giving light, a uh, spirit lamp using some sort of spirit like a um, flammable liquid. Um, right, anyway, he's boiling water on it, um, and, um, he said, incidentally, my, like, by the way, also, um, I was admiring the swamp under the sunset, so he was looking at the view and admiring it, looking at it and thinking about how nice it looked. All black and blood red it was, in streaks. So the sunset was all blood red, um, admiring the swamp, so the swamp 
under the sunset was black and blood red supposedly the i suppose the swamp was black blood red because of the light from the sunset in streaks in these long lines a beautiful sight and up beyond the land rose gray and hazy to the hills so beyond or further away from the swamp you can see the land rising up into the hills and it's kind of gray and hazy hazy meaning meaning not completely clear there was like a mist in the air and the sky behind them was red like a furnace mouth a furnace is like a very 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 hot fire in an industrial factory or something like the hottest fire that you can get really really you know a furnace would be used for melting metal and stuff like that so powerful deep hot fire so the sky was red like a furnace like the mouth of a furnace and 50 yards behind the back of me so down there, sort of, you know, 40 meters or something down there on the beach were these two locals I'd brought along, quite uninterested in the tranquil air of things and this incredible view, plotting to cut me off, uh, plotting to cut off with the boat and leave me all alone. So he's saying that these two local guys were down there. They weren't interested at all in this beautiful view um the tranquil the peaceful atmosphere the tranquil air the peaceful atmosphere of everything they were down there plotting like planning to cut off meaning to escape to run a run away or uh, escape in the boat with the boat and leave me all alone with three days provisions and a canvas tent and nothing to drink whatsoever beyond a little keg of water so they were planning to abandon him with only these few things and nothing to drink whatsoever so whatsoever is at all absolutely nothing to drink at all nothing to drink whatsoever beyond except for a little keg of water a keg is like a little um small barrel let's say like a small barrel of water might be a couple of liters maybe now if they if they abandon him with that then he'll survive for a few days with that water. But if he can't get access to drinking water, which it sounds like he can't, considering this, you know, the, the environment he's in, then he'll definitely die. You know, there's no escape from that on foot. Um, you know, he's completely cut off. So he's definitely going to die on this island if he can't escape. If they genuinely manage to abandon him, he's dead, right? So they, they are planning to abandon him and leave him to die on his own. I mean, you know, they clearly, they don't like Butcher. I mean, that's for sure. They must hate him completely and they've had enough. So anyway, I heard a kind of yelp behind me. A yelp, this might be like a kind of like a, I don't know, it might be the sound that you would hear of, of them shouting to each other. Yelp is kind of like, like that kind of sound. Like a dog might make a yelp. So it's sort of like a shouting sound or a noise that someone would make um maybe if like go go or a, uh, uh, like that sort of noise heard a yelp behind me um and there they were in this little canoe thing it wasn't properly a boat in the water and perhaps 20 yards from land so they're like you know nearly 20 meters away already in the water i realized what was up in a moment meaning up here meaning happening I realized what was happening, what was up in a moment. My gun was in the tent. And besides, I had no bullets, only duck shot. So his gun, I suppose, is a long gun, like a shotgun. He didn't have any bullets in it anyway, only duck shot. Duck shot is stuff that you would use to shoot a duck out of the sky. It's not a solid bullet. It's just, uh, it, it's like little pieces, right? Which when shot out of a, a shotgun can be used to shoot something at fairly close range. I mean, it's not a long range. It's not a sort of long range ammunition. So just like pieces that come out that fire out in a kind of a, a group, little cloud, and you could use it to shoot a duck, you know, at maybe 20 meters away or something. But um, it's, you know, you can't really shoot a person over a long distance with that. And they, they knew that. They knew that he, his gun was no good. But I had a little revolver in my pocket. So a handgun, right? A pistol. He had a revolver in his pocket, probably one with about six bullets in it. And I pulled that out. So he got it out of his pocket as I ran down the beach. So he's running down the beach with this pistol, this little gun in his hand. 
Come back, I said, waving it in the air, meaning come back, look, and he's showing them the gun. They jabbered something at me. So to jabber is, I guess, sort of like shout in a foreign language, just sort of like shout, but he couldn't really hear the words. Um, and the man that broke the egg jeered. So to jeer is to like, a bit like what football fans do. Who are you? Right? Um, so the man that broke the egg jeered as if to say, oh, you know, yeah, screw you. You know, he made a noise and maybe pointed at him like, Ugh. he jeered. I aimed at the other. So he's aiming the gun at the other guy because he was unwounded. I mean, he didn't have an injury. He didn't have uh, this bite and he had the paddle. So the paddle is the thing that you use to move the boat through the water, right? You hold it in your hands and you dip it in the water and you paddle with the paddle, right? And you're in a canoe. Um, so he's aiming at the other guy because he's unwounded and he had the paddle and he missed and they laughed. Now bear in mind they're quite far away from him and he's got this little gun. However, he said, I wasn't beaten. I knew I had to keep cool and I tried him again and made him jump as it whizzed past him. So the second shot he got, he kind of decided to keep cool. So he was like, <sighs> he concentrated and shot again. And this time the bullet whizzed past the guy with the paddle, meaning it shoo, it went past him quite close. Whiz is the sound of a the sound that something moving through the air very fast would make, shoo, like that, shoo, like that. It bang, shoo, the bullet whizzed past him. He didn't laugh that time. The third time, I got his head, and over he went into the water and the paddle with him. So he just he actually shoots the guy in the boat with his revolver, third shot, he shoots him in the head, uh, just murders him, uh, shoots him in the head, and, and the guy just goes over, falls into the water, and the paddle goes in the water too. It was a precious, lucky shot for a revolver. Um, right, because you, it's very difficult to shoot long range with a little gun like that. I reckon, meaning I think, it was 50 yards away. He went right under, I mean, he went right under the water. I don't know if he was shot or simply stunned and drowned. St if you're stunned, it means that you, um, you just can't really move. So maybe he was unconscious. If you're stunned, you might have been unconscious or just shocked uh, and drowned. If you drown, it means you die in the water because you can't breathe. So he doesn't know if he just killed him instantly or if the guy just drowned. Then I began to shout to the other chap. So chap is a sort of old fashioned word or maybe a sort of very posh word for a man. You know, like, hello, old chap. Sort of thing that old fashioned sort of posh people would say. Look at this chap over here. He's a good chap. Uh, it means man. So I, sh I began to shout to the other chap to come back. Come now, look here, come back. You can imagine the sort of old fashioned way that he would have spoken. But he huddled up in the canoe. So he huddled up, meaning he sort of like brought his legs in close to him, wrapped his arms around his body, huddled up and kind of like hid, hid down in the canoe and refused to answer. So he's like, come back with that bloody canoe. Come back with that damn canoe. But he, he just hid in the canoe and didn't answer. So I fired out my revolver at him, but never got near him. So he continued shooting at him, but missed. I felt like an utter fool like a complete idiot. I can tell you. There I was on this rotten black beach. Rotten meaning horrible, terrible. Right. Um, what do we have? Infernal, damned. Um, rotten. I mean, rotten would be like, what, what, what do we have before? Um, to uh, decompose, decay, to decompose, to decay and to rot. Okay more or less the same kind of thing. If you pick an apple from the fruit bowl, it's been there for weeks and you don't realize you pick it and ugh, it's gone all brown and yucky. It's, it's rotten. It's a rotten apple. Don't eat it. A rotten, that's what rotten means, but it also can mean horrible. So I felt like a complete fool, an utter fool. There I was on this rotten black beach, flat swamp all behind me, 
and the flat cold sea after the sunset and just this black canoe drifting steadily out to sea. So that's the situation. He's stuck on this beach in the middle of nowhere, um, swamp behind him, cold flat sea in front of him and this black canoe slowly drifting out to sea. What a ridiculous situation to find yourself in. I tell you, I cursed Dawson's and Jamracks and museums and all the rest of it. Curse is to shout words of abuse about them, like, oh, Dawson's, damn you, Dawson's! Um, in, in modern language, it would be like, fucking, you know, you'd use all the swear words. Um, I shouted at the local to come back until my voice went up into a scream. Come back, I tell you, come back! Until his voice goes into a scream. Okay. <laughs> there was nothing for it but to swim after him and take my luck with the sharks. So I opened my clasp knife. Clasp knife is a knife that folds into itself. He opened it up, put it in my mouth, bit it, I suppose, with his teeth or something, and took off my clothes and waded in. So to wade is to walk in water. So he waded in, he walked into the water. As soon as I was in the water, I lost sight of the canoe. So he couldn't see the canoe, because, you know, when you're low to the water, it's difficult to see. But I aimed, meaning I tried to go in the right direction, as I judged to head it off. So if the boat is drifting in, in one way, if you want to head it off, you go in a way to, you go in a direction where eventually you'll, you'll meet the same, you'll meet the direction it's going in. You'll go just beyond it and catch it further, further up. Right, you'll kind of get round the front of it. Okay, to head it off. I judge to head it off. I hope the man in it was too bad to navigate it. He just hoped that the guy just couldn't, couldn't direct the, 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 the canoe and that it would keep on drifting in the same direction. So he's hoping it's going to keep drifting in that direction. He decided to try and aim for that spot where he'd be able to ultimately get the canoe. Just then it came up over the horizon. So he noticed it uh, maybe on a wave or something over the horizon. He saw it again towards the southwest. The afterglow of sunset was well over now. The afterglow, that's when the sun has gone down and you don't get the direct light of the sun, but you get the afterglow in the sky. After the sun has set, after the sun has gone down, there might still be light in the air and that's called the afterglow. The afterglow of sunset was well over now and the dim of the night was creeping up. Dim refers to a, a, a low light situation. Uh, if something is dim, it means it's not bright. On your computer screen, you can uh, raise the brightness of the screen, right? You can make it brighter or you can make it dimmer. You can brighten or dim the, scre the screen. To dim your screen, to make your screen go dim, right? To reduce the brightness. So anyway, the, the dim of the night was creeping up. It was slowly coming up. The, car the stars were coming through the blue of the sky. I swum like a champion though my legs and arms were soon aching. So his legs and arms were, still, were soon uh, in pain. However, I came up to him by the time the stars were fully out. Okay, so eventually he gets to the canoe. By, the time, by that time, it's completely dark. The stars are all completely out. As it got darker, I began to see all manner of glowing things in the water. Phosphorescence, you know. So he's saying that he begin, as, as it gets darker, he begins to see all these, all types of strange glowing things in the water, phosphorescence. So this is a thing that happens in some parts of the world where there's kind of um, sea life, uh, microorganisms in the water that actually give off light. They're phosphorescent and it causes the water to glow, a kind of a greeny blue kind of color glowing phosphorescence in the water. So what a strange situation, what a strange scene where, you know, he's, he's swimming in this water in the, in the darkness with the stars overhead and this glowing phosphorescence in the water all around him. And he continues, at times it made me dizzy. If you're dizzy, it's like 
you know, you, you start to lose sense of what's up and what's down. You feel like you're going to fall over, right? If you're dizzy, if you spin round and round and round, when you stop, you feel dizzy, like, whoa, I feel like I'm going to fall over, right? If you've been sitting down and you stand up too fast, you, you feel a bit dizzy, right? So anyway, all this weird light in the water made him feel dizzy. I hardly knew which was stars and which was phosphorescence and whether I was swimming on my head or my heels. So he didn't know which direction he was in or what. His head, you know, his heels is basically the bottom of his body. Your heel is the back of your foot. You've got your toes at the front and your heels at the back. So it's like the bottom of your body. I didn't know if I was swimming on my head or my heels. So the top or the bottom. The canoe was pitch black. Pitch black just means completely black, as black as pitch. Pitch is a sort of, again, a sort of an oily um, paint that would be used to paint on the sides of a boat to protect the wood from, from the, the, the water. It means that the wood doesn't decay um, because it's protected by this oily paint. That's pitch. And if we say something is pitch black, it means it's completely black because this, this pitch, this kind of oily paint, that was used to protect wood um, was really, really dark black. So now we say pitch black. Um, and that would be like, you know, at night, you could say it's pitch black at night. There's no light, you know, um, w when I switch the light off, it's completely pitch black. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And in this case, he said the canoe was pitch black, meaning completely black. It's very difficult to see. And the ripple under the bows, like liquid fire, the ripple is like the way the water moves. You know, if you throw a stone into water, the water ripples. So the ripple under the bows, under the body of the boat, under the body of the canoe, the, the water was rippling like liquid fire because of all the phosphorescence. I was naturally wary of clambering up into it. If you're wary of doing something, it's like you're hmm, cautious, not think you think it's maybe not a very good idea. Hmm, not sure I should climb into this canoe because he thinks that this guy is in there. So I was naturally wary of clambering up into it, wary of doing something, right? In this case, clambering. Clambering means climbing. It might be just in a slightly more clumsy kind of way. So I was wary of clambering up into the boat. I wasn't sure if I should climb, in, climb into the boat. I was anxious to see what he was up to first, meaning he was like nervous and wanted to see what the guy was doing, what he was up to. He seemed to be lying, cuddled up in a lump in the bows. He was cuddled up, meaning sort of like he, he, lying maybe with his legs up against his body, his arms around him, you know, huddled, cuddled up. Normally you cuddle something, you cuddle a teddy bear or cuddle a person. In this case, he was cuddled up, meaning cuddling himself maybe, in a lump, like um, probably, he probably curled himself up into a ball but not really a ball, a kind of, in this case, just a lump um, in the bows. In the bows, it'd be the, the, the end part of the boat. So he's all like uh, crouched and lying down in the bows of the, of the boat. And the stern was up out of the water. I guess the stern is the back end of the boat and the stern is like lifted up because he's in, this, this guy is, in the front of the boat, so the back of the boat's kind of lifted up out of the water. The thing kept turning round slowly as it drifted, kind of waltzing, don't you know? So the boat is describing the way the boat's kind of like drip, turning and drifting, as if it's doing a waltz, you know, that dance. Um, I went to the stern and pulled it down, expecting him to wake up. Then I began to clamber in with my knife in my hand and ready for a rush, ready for the guy to rush him. So if you rush someone, it means you quickly go to get them, right? He was ready for a rush. So he had his knife ready, climbed in, ready to defend himself, but he never stirred. To stir, meaning to move, right? Okay. Like, I don't know, if you go into a, if you go into a cave and 
you realize in the cave there's a bear in the cave <gasps> there's a bear in the cave it's a he must be hibernating. Don't wake him up. And then you realize the bear is moving. Oh my God, it's stirring. The bear started stirring. The bear started like moving and waking up. And, the, and then you go to the bear. It's all right, I brought you some breakfast. There you go. Would you like a, a croissant? And the bear's like, uh, merci. Because it's a French bear. <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway, so he gets into the boat, but the guy doesn't stir. He doesn't move. So there I sat in the stern of the little canoe drifting away over the calm phosphorescent sea and with all the host of the stars above me waiting for something to happen. After a long time I called him by name but he never answered. I was too tired to take any risks by going up to him so he was too tired to risk going to see the, the guy so we just sat there. So him in the stern, the other guy in the bow of the, of the canoe, they're just drifting and he said, I think I dozed off once or twice. To doze off means to fall asleep. Like, <sighs> doze off. Like you would do on a bus or something. <sighs> doze off on the bus. Uh, in this case, he dozed off at the, in, uh, on the back of the boat. You can, you can doze off in other situations. You don't have to be on a, a form of transport. I was sitting on the sofa and I dozed off. Or I was listening to Luke's English podcast and I dozed off for about two hours best sleep I've ever had. When the dawn came, when the sun came up, I saw he was as dead as a doornail. So there's an idiom for you. As dead as a doornail, meaning very dead. Okay? As dead as a doornail. Um, mm -hmm. Very dead. A doornail. Well, a doornail is a nail that you use to make a door and I suppose, I mean, there must be an origin. There'll be an origin story for that. We don't have time to go into it now. But all you need to know is as dead as a doornail uh, just means very dead. Okay? So completely dead. And all puffed up and purple. Ugh. That's a bit, that's a bit, um, that's a bit disgusting, isn't it? It's all puffed up. So clearly his body had reacted to the uh, poison or venom from this nasty caterp uh, caterpillar, no, this nasty centipede which had bitten him or stung him had clearly poisoned him and he was completely dead and all puffed up, meaning that his body was all swollen. Hello, this is me interrupting myself because I wanted to just add something about the words poison and venom and poisonous and venomous, okay, because that's come up a couple of times, I think, and I didn't really deal with it. I feel like I should. So the difference between venom and poison, well, uh, venom is basically, well, they're, they're both sort of harmful substances that can be produced by animals, although in the case of poison or poisonous, that could come from plants as well. Really, the, the, the main difference is the fact that venom is directly injected or actively injected into an animal's body. Right, it's actively injected into a into someone's body by an animal, and those animals are usually snakes, spiders, and wasps. Okay, wasps which uh, have a sting in their tail. A wasp is like a bee; they're like sort of like the bad guy versions of bees, sort of thing. Um, yellow and black stripes, but they don't produce honey. They just sting and bother you at picnics. That's wasps. So snakes, spiders and wasps, uh, scorpions, centipedes, they all have venom and they are venomous animals. OK, uh, poison isn't um, injected into uh, someone's body. Instead, poison is absorbed uh, through the skin, inhaled, you know, through the lungs or ingested, meaning swallowed, eaten. And uh, poisonous animals deliver poison or toxic chemicals if another animal touches or eats them. And that includes things like uh, certain frogs can be poisonous um, and other like amphibians and things like that. So basically, venom is actively injected, probably by a spider, snake um, or an animal with a sting, uh, while poison is delivered passively. So that's the difference between venom and poison. And in this case, these, the, uh, what was it, um, a centipede, the centipede, when it um, technically uh, stung this guy, although the stings are at the front, so it looks like a bite, 
um, it injected uh, venom into his body and clearly killed him. A very nasty way to die, I'm sure. You know, like a puffer fish, those fish that if they if someone threatens them, they inflate and sort of puff up. Um, so that's oh, that's a bit uh, a bit disgusting, isn't it? His body was all purple and puffed up, so he was completely dead, and his body had reacted by swelling up and changing colour. The story continues. My three eggs and the bones were lying in the middle of the canoe and the keg of water and some coffee and biscuits wrapped in a Cape Argus newspaper by his feet and a tin of methylated spirit underneath him. So these are all the things that were in the boat. Methylated spirit. It's a kind of, it's a kind of flammable or inflammable liquid. For me, we always used to have methylated spirit in the garage at home, um, in my parents' house, and we used to use it to, to clean paint off paintbrushes. So if you've been painting something with a kind of oil-based paint, you'd use methylated spirit to clean all of the paint off the brush. So it's a sort of a, a fluid. Denatured alcohol. Okay. So methylated spirits, meth, meths, meths. We call it meths. Um, denatured alcohol. Anyway, it's a sort of a, a, a kind of alcoholic fluid, a pure alcohol that you'd, you'd use to clean oil off of off things. So that was in there too. There was no paddle, nor in fact anything except the spirit tin. So this methylated spirit was kept in a metal tin, a metal container. container. So there was nothing except the spirit tin, tin that I could use as a paddle. So I settled to drift until I was picked up. So he just sort of like decided, okay, well, I'm just going to have to drift and wait until I'm picked up. Wait until a boat discovers me and they get me. I examined him, decided he'd been bitten by some snake, scorpion or centipede unknown and sent him overboard. Overboard means off the boat and in the water. So the guy, he looked at him, decided he'd been bitten by something and just pushed him into the sea. Another, you know, another tragic death there. After that, I had a drink of water and a few biscuits and took a look around. I suppose a man positioned as low down as I was doesn't see very far. In any case, Madagascar was clean out of sight and any trace of land at all. So he couldn't see anything. He couldn't see Madagascar. He couldn't see any land at all. It was completely out of sight. Um, he couldn't see it. Out of sight means it's you can't see it, probably because it's too far away. And any trace of land, trace of land, like even a tiny, tiny amount of land, he couldn't see one single bit of land at all, nothing, because he drifted so far. Um, I saw a sail going southwestward. A sail, this is the sail of a boat, right? The thing that is raised up to catch the wind. It's called a sail. So I saw, saw a sail going southwestward, looked like a schooner. This is a sort of a boat, a kind of ship, but her hull never came up into view near me. So the, the actual uh, body of the boat never actually became visible. So it was too far away. Then the sun got high up in the sky and began to beat down upon me. So this is what the sun does. It beats down, meaning it shines down powerfully. My goodness, it, it pretty near made my brains boil. Right, you can imagine what that means. It was so hot. I tried dipping my head in the sea, like putting my head in the sea, like down into the water and out again. I tried dipping my head in the sea, but after a while my eye fell on the Cape Argus newspaper. So he sort of like, he noticed the newspaper on the floor. His eye fell on it, so he noticed it. And I lay down flat in the canoe and spread this over me. So he covered himself with this newspaper. In those days, newspapers were massive, weren't they? Um, wonderful things, these newspapers. I'd never read one so thoroughly before. So he's lying in the canoe with the newspaper on top of him and he's reading the newspaper and reading every single thing, reading it thoroughly, reading it in full detail. But it's odd what you get up to when you're alone, as I was. 
So it's, it's odd, it's strange what you do, what you get up to, right? When you're alone, as I was. I suppose I read that old Cape Argus 20 times. The pitch in the canoe simply reeked with the heat. So that pitch, again, is that oily black paint that they would have used to protect the wood of the canoe against the salty seawater. So the pitch, this black paint in the canoe, simply reeked, meaning it stank, it smelled really strong. It reeked with the heat and it rose up into big blisters. So the, 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 the oily paint was blistering. Blisters are like bubbles that rise up. Um, now, if you get badly sunburned, then you might get blisters. Also, you get blisters if you're wearing new shoes and you go for a long walk in new shoes and the shoes rub against the side of your foot and you end up with a blister. So the pitch in the canoe, the paint of the canoe, really smelled really strong and it rose up into these blisters because it was being sort of boiled by the sun. That gives you an idea of just how hot it must have been. I drifted for 10 days, said the man with the scar. It's a little thing in the telling, isn't it? In the telling, meaning when you tell the story, it seems like such a small thing. Yeah, I got stranded on a boat in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Um, is it the Indian Ocean? I think it is. Um, for 10 days. It sounds like a small thing when you say it. But it must have been an absolutely horrendous ordeal. Every day was like the last, except in the morning and the evening, I couldn't even keep a lookout. The blaze of the sun was so unbearable. So he couldn't keep a lookout. He couldn't actually watch around him to see for, you know, see if he could see boats or land or something. He couldn't, couldn't keep a lookout. You keep a lookout if you're, you know, if you're camping in the forest or something, you might have, you know, some of the people in your party would sleep and then one person keeps a lookout. They sit there making sure that there are no tigers or something that are going to come and get you. Keep a lookout. Um, or if you're, you know, standing on the walls of the castle, you know, you keep a lookout and keep looking for things. Uh, the blaze of the sun, the hot, the heat of the sun was, too, was so unbearable. Um, it was just too hot to bear, too hot to take, too hot. To, he couldn't stand it. I didn't see a sail after the first three days, and, I, and those I saw took no notice of me, meaning that they either ignored him or didn't see him. About the sixth night, a ship went by only about half a mile away from me with all its lights ablaze. So its lights were on bright and its ports open, meaning the windows on the sides of the boat were all open, looking like a big firefly. Firefly is a kind of insect that glows up, another sort of um, creature that can emit light. A firefly is a sort of fly that comes out at night and it glows up. So a bright thing. So he saw this thing in the distance. Uh, it looked like a kind of a, a firefly. It was a boat with all its lights on. And there was music aboard. So he could actually hear music. Aboard meaning on board, on the ship, on the boat. There was music. So, you know, uh, must have been people... Uh, maybe having a little party on their boat or something. I stood up and shouted and screamed at it, but to no avail. So, but uh, it didn't actually help. Nothing happened as a result. The second day I tapped a hole in one of the Apionis eggs. So tap, 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 a little hole in the egg, scraped the shell away, maybe with this fingernail bit by bit or with the, with something he'd like scraped, like the, took the edge of the shell off little bit by little bit and tried it like tasted it i mean he must have been desperate right uh, you would be you would be absolutely desperate if you're starving to death you will eat anything you will if it's a question of starving to death or eating what could be a disgusting thing you might choose the disgusting thing in fact you probably would right especially if you are not ready to die right if you're determined to stay alive you would do that sort of thing. So he tried it and he said, I was glad to find it was good enough to eat. A bit flavory, meaning the flavor was quite strong. Not bad, I mean, but with some, not bad, I mean, but with something of the taste of a duck's egg. <laughs> so it didn't, sounds like it tasted like fairly good, actually. There was a kind of circular patch 
a patch is a sort of area uh patch if you're wearing um if you're wearing a jacket right and the it's an old jacket and the elbow of the jacket has got a hole in it or if you've got a pair of jeans trousers with a hole in you would have to put a patch over the hole you'd sew a patch on the hole or put People sometimes have like leather patches on their elbows of their jacket, right? So that's a patch, a kind of a circular area. There was a kind of circular patch about six inches across. That's about um, 15 centimeters across on one side of the yoke. So uh, vocabulary of an egg here, you've got the, the shell of the egg. And then if you open up the egg inside, you've got the white when you cook it, it's the bit that goes white. And then you've got the yolk, right? We don't call it the yellow of the egg. We call it the yolk of the egg, Y-O-L-K. So there was a sort of circular patch about six inches across on one side of the yolk. So the yellow part of the egg had a, 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 a sort of circular area on one side of it with streaks of blood and a white mark like a ladder in it, right? Streaks of blood, like lines of red blood and a white mark, like a ladder. So a white mark that had these kind of like ladder, you know, like a ladder that you'd use to climb onto the roof. So it's got these white lines on it. Um, and I thought it looked a bit odd. I thought it looked a bit strange, but I didn't understand what this meant at the time. So I suppose, I suppose what this is suggesting is that this, this egg was actually a fertilized egg. And... Um, that maybe this this kind of weird patch with the streaks of blood and the white mark like a ladder, this was the early beginnings of the embryo developing inside the shell. I suppose that's what this means. Um, and I wasn't inclined to be too fussy and as I was so completely ravenous. So you basically didn't really feel like being fussy. If you're fussy, you, you if you're a fussy eater, it's like, no, no, I don't like mushrooms. No, I don't want the mushrooms. Thanks very much. No, oh, you're a bit fussy, aren't you? To be fussy is like when you sort of only eat the things you really like. And you, no, I don't want to eat the other things. Yeah, I'm a bit fussy. I'm sorry. Um, so in this case, he said, I wasn't inclined, meaning I didn't really feel like uh, being. I wasn't inclined to be too fussy as I was so completely ravenous. Ravenous means incredibly hungry, starving, ravenous. These are the extreme adjectives we use to describe being very hungry. The egg lasted me three days with biscuits and a drink of water. I chewed coffee berries too, invigorating stuff. So he's chewing these coffee berries. It's invigorating, meaning if it invigorates you, it sort of like gives you a burst of energy and sort of like feels quite exciting. I suppose it made his heart beat. Um, whatever it is that's in those coffee uh, berries that sort of like stimulated him. It was stimulating, invigorating stuff. The second egg I opened about the eighth day and it scared me. So he suddenly got frightened by what he saw. The man with the scar paused. Yes, he said, it was developing. I expect you find it hard to believe. I did with the thing right in front of me. There the egg had been sunk in that cold black mud. So to sink, meaning go down into the mud sink in the water, like the Titanic, sank, sink, sank, sunk. So there the egg had been, it had been sunk in that cold black mud, perhaps three or 400 years or more, but there was no mistaking it. There was the, what was it, embryo. So the embryo, in this case, the embryo of a bird is the early stage of the baby bird, right? So as, the, um, as the, the cells divide and divide and divide, you end up getting, first of all, an embryo, like the very early stage of, in this case, the bird. Um, embryo becomes fetus, becomes baby, right? So there was the embryo. You could see it looked kind of like a bird, I suppose. When he opened the... the um, second egg right this is what frightened him he could see the embryo with its big head and curved back and its heart beating under its throat so its its heart was beating and the yolk that's the yellow part of the egg shriveled up 
So the yolk had like zoo, gone all small, a bit like if you leave an egg out in the sun or something. The yolk will get smaller and drier. It'll shrivel up. Again, like a fruit, if you leave a fruit out in the sun, it'll shrivel, right? Or if your fingers, if you, if you, if you have a bath for too long, you look at your fingers, your fingers start to shrivel. So there it was. The, the yolk was shriveled up and great membranes spreading inside of the shell and all over the yolk. So membranes are like layers of tissue. Tissue means, it's hard to explain really, just all like the um, matter of, of, of a body, like uh, skin and the cells create membranes, layers of like flesh, I suppose. So basically, this egg was developing and there was the embryo, a young bird actually developing. But it, it was like he caught it part of the way through its development. It hadn't finished um, developing. And so it was kind of like halfway between egg and bird. Ugh. <laughs> here I was, or here was I, which is a slightly old fashioned structure. Here was I, or here I was hatching out the eggs of the biggest of all extinct birds in a little canoe in the midst of the Indian Ocean. So to hatch is when an egg, when a bird breaks out of an egg, the egg hatches, uh, the, the bird hatches from the egg, and you can hatch an egg. Right, if you are um, keeping birds or uh, uh, raising birds or whatever, you could hatch uh, hatch out an egg, meaning make the bird come out of the egg. Here I was hatching out the eggs of the biggest of all extinct birds in a little canoe in the midst of the Indian Ocean, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. If old Dawson had known that, it was worth four years' salary. What do you think? However, I had to eat that precious thing up. The eat it up, meaning eat the whole thing. Every bit of it. Before I sighted the reef. So he, again, because he was, he had no choice, I suppose. He was going to starve to death. It was either starve to death in this canoe, which is not a nice way to die. I mean, it's, I mean, I wouldn't know, thankfully, but I understand that it must be like going completely insane. Uh, and if you've got an option, even if it's something quite hideous, again, you're going to choose that. You're going to choose to survive. So he had to eat the precious thing. Precious meaning very valuable. He had to eat it up, every bit of it, before I sighted the reef. Right? Before I saw this reef, this coral uh, reef, uh, where I suppose the atoll, this atoll was part of this reef. Um, some of the mouthfuls, like the, a mouthful is like one amount of food that goes in your mouth. Some of the mouthfuls were horribly unpre unpleasant, like completely disgusting. Like, oh, you can imagine him eating it. Oh, oh. <sighs> but you know, you do what you've got to do to survive. I left the third one alone. So the third egg, he just left it. I held it up to the light meaning held it up so that the, the light would shine into the egg. But the shell was too thick for me to get any notion, get any idea of what might be happening inside. And though I thought I heard blood pulsing, so that's what blood does, it... Blood pulses around your body. I thought I heard blood pulsing, it might have been the sound in my own ears, like what you listen to in a seashell. So he's got the egg up to his... He's holding the egg up to his uh, ear and he can hear he can hear a pulsing sound but he doesn't know if it's something inside the egg or if it's just the sound in his own ear. Like when you take a big seashell, put the seashell up to your up to your ear, you can you, they say that you can hear the sea. It's actually just the sound of like the air moving around inside the seashell and inside your ear and it creates that sort of pulsing whooshing sound. So he doesn't know really if the if he can hear any signs of life in it or if he's just imagining it. Then came the atoll. That's like this circular island with a lake in the middle. It came out of the sunrise, suddenly close up to me. So as the sun was coming up, 
as the sun came up and the light arrived, then there it was, quite close. I drifted straight towards it until I was about half a mile from shore, so half a mile from the, 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 the edge of the thing, and then the current took a turn, meaning the way the water was moving, you know, the w water has currents in it that move this way and move that way, the current took a turn and I had to paddle as hard as I could with my hands, so the current was about to drag him away from the island, but he had to paddle with his hands and paddle with bits of the shell to make it to the place. However, I got there, so he had to fight to get to the island. It was just a common atoll, about four miles round, with a few trees growing and a spring in one place. A spring, this is a, uh, a place where fresh, drinkable water, fresh water comes. That's not salty water, not seawater, but fresh water. A spring, like a little place where the water comes up from the ground. That's pretty lucky. Uh, it was a, just a common atoll, about four miles round, that's about five, six kilometers round, with a few trees growing and a spring in one place. And the lagoon, the lake in the middle, full of parrotfish. I took the egg ashore, took the egg onto the island, and put it in a good place, well above the tide lines. So on the beach you have these tide lines. The tide, you know, that's the way the sea... Uh, oh, during the course of a day, the sea will go high and the sea will go low. This is the tide. And there are tide lines on the beach. So the tide lines are just show the point at which the, the high tide, where the high tide reached before it went back. These are tide lines and they'll tell you roughly where the tide, where the water gets to at high tide. So he put the egg above the tide lines so it wouldn't be washed away by the water. And in the sun, to give it all the chance I could, so he kept it warm, and pulled the canoe up safe, so pulled the canoe out of the water, and wandered about prospecting, so he walked around the island, looking for things that he might need, so prospecting, looking for things. It's funny how dull an atoll is, it's like funny, it's strange, how boring an atoll is. As soon as I'd found the spring, all the interest seemed to vanish. So he found the spring water and then just like suddenly this is the most boring place in the world. When I was a boy, I thought nothing could be finer or more adventurous than the Robinson Crusoe business. So he's referring to Robinson Crusoe, that uh, famous story by who wrote Robinson Crusoe, why can't I remember? Robert Louis Stevenson, is it? Daniel Defoe. Daniel Defoe. So, Robinson Crusoe, that famous story of a guy who gets stranded on a desert island, and he, um, so this is like the, the, the reference for this kind of story, right? So he said, when I was a boy, I thought nothing could be finer or more adventurous than the Robinson Crusoe business. So he, he imagined that being stuck on a desert island would be great, a great adventure. But that place was as monotonous as a book of sermons. That place was monotonous, like the same every single day, just boring. Nothing ever changed. It was boring. As boring as a book of sermons. As boring as a book of sermons are sort of uh, speeches given by a priest in a church. By the way, I don't know if you can hear the, the sound of a person banging in the corridor outside my podcasting room. I do apologise uh, that's someone fitting a window uh, in in, a, in one of the, the rooms out there. And, you know, I'll forgive them because they need to have a window, right? They can't just live with a big hole in the side of the wall. Um, but anyway, sorry about the noise. It, uh, hopefully it won't be too bad. Anyway, um, I went round, meaning walked around, finding edible things, things I could eat, and generally thinking... But I tell you, I was bored to death before the first day was out. That's terrible. Like, even before the end of the first day, he was completely bored. It shows my luck. The very day I landed, the weather changed. A thunderstorm went by to the north. So, thunderstorm, wind, heavy rain, lightning, right? Electrical lightning in the sky and thunder. Thunder is the sound. <laughs> That's thunder, the sound, and lightning is the actual electricity. So a thunderstorm went by to the north and flicked its wing over the island. So a thunderstorm passed very close to the island and just like one 
edge of the thunderstorm went over the island. And in the night there came an absolute downpour. A downpour is very, very heavy rain. A period of very, very heavy rain. And I suppose out there it would have been ridiculously heavy. And a howling wind slapped overhead. So, <whistles> howling is normally the sound that, like a wolf would make a howling sound. Ow! In this case, wind is howling. <whistles> a howling wind slapped overhead, meaning over the top, and a downpour of rain. It wouldn't have taken much, you know, to upset that canoe. Upset the canoe. So he's imagining what would have happened if he'd been caught in that thunderstorm while in the canoe out in the water, I think. And it wouldn't have taken much to make the canoe, um, like, um, turn over in the water. So he's like, in a way, lucky that, it, that the storm happened when he was on the island and not out um, on the water. I think that's what that refers to. Or at least it was like, he was sleeping under the canoe, right? Anyway, um, yeah, I was sleeping under the canoe and the egg was luckily in the sand higher up the beach. And the first thing I remember was a sound like a hundred pebbles hitting the boat at once. So he'd, I guess he turned the canoe upside down, sleeping underneath it. Suddenly he heard the sound of a hundred pebbles hitting the boat. Pebbles are li little stones. You, there might be like little stones you find on a beach. If you've ever been to Brighton in England, the stone is the, the beach is covered in pebbles, little round stones that you find on the beach. It's like a hundred pebbles <laughs> hitting the boat at once. That's the sound of the heavy rain and a rush of water over my body. This is suppose maybe the rainwater or it could be the sea. You know, maybe the tide has come in and the sea, a, w a wave crashes over him. I'd been dreaming of Antananarivo and I sat up and shouted to Intoshi, my maid, to ask her what the hell was going on. So he was dreaming and he woke up going, what the hell's going on, Intoshi? And then he realised that, um, then he woke up or he clawed out to the chair where the matches used to be. So he's like dreaming that he's back in his, in, in, you know, back in his bedroom, reaching out to try and pick up some matches to light a candle or something. And then I remembered where I was all alone, stranded. Stranded just means stuck in a place where you can't, you can't leave. So imagine waking up from your, some deep sleep, thinking that you're in your room and like, what's going on? What's happening? And trying to get matches. And then you realize, oh my God, I'm on a beach in the middle of the Indian Ocean, um, under a canoe and in the middle of a thunderstorm. What the, what the hell's going on? There were phosphorescent waves rolling up. So again, this, these waves with this weird glowing, uh, with these weird glowing microorganisms in them, these strangely bright colored waves rolling up as if they meant to eat me. So the waves were rolling up towards him very close and all the rest of the night was pitch black. So everything else completely black. The air was simply yelling. Yelling is shouting very loudly. So the air was just going rah, like that with the wind and the rain and the sound of the waves just the clouds seemed down on your head almost and the rain fell as if heaven was sinking and they were bailing out the water above the sky. So if you're in a boat that's sinking, you bail out the water. So you, you get like buckets or whatever you can get and you, you take it and you tip all of the water out of the boat that's sinking. That's bailing out the water. So it was raining as if heaven in the sky above him was sinking and they were tipping out all of the water. So they're basically as if heaven was emptying all of its water down onto the ground. One great roller, one big wave came writhing at me, like writhing, sort of like uh, moving, twisting, a bit like a snake or something in the water, like a fiery serpent. A serpent is a snake. And I bolted, meaning I ran for it, escaped. Then I thought of the canoe and ran down to it as the water went hissing back again. So a wave comes in and then shh, the water goes back out and he ran back down to get the, uh, the canoe. But the thing had gone. So the wave had taken the canoe. And I wondered about the egg then. 
which was further up the beach and I felt my way to it because obviously it's pitch black he can't see anything so he's like feeling along the beach trying to find the egg finds his way up to the egg it was all right and well out of reach of the maddest waves so the waves couldn't get it so I sat down beside it and cuddled it for company lord what a night it was you can imagine him just like sitting there cuddling this egg while the storm slowly passes the storm was over before the morning there wasn't a rag of cloud left in the sky there wasn't any trace of cloud a rag is like a a ripped piece of material like a maybe a piece of an old shirt that you'd use to like clean the windows or something that's a rag so there wasn't a rag of cloud meaning a, there wasn't even a, a little piece of cloud left in the sky when the dawn came and all along the beach there were bits of plank scattered planks are long pieces of wood so clearly this was the canoe that the, the sea had taken the canoe and then washed it back onto the beach and taken it and smashed it to pieces and so there were bits of broken wood all along the beach which was the broken up skeleton so to speak of my canoe however that gave me something to do for taking advantage of two of the trees being together I rigged up a kind of storm shelter with these bits and pieces, okay? And that day, the egg hatched. So um, he picked up all these bits of, bits of wood and kind of rigged up, like, uh, built, in a basic kind of way, built a sort of storm shelter with all the bits of uh, wood between two trees, which he found close together. So he built a kind of shelter for himself. And on that day, the egg hatched. Hatched, sir, when my head was pillowed on it and I was asleep. So he had his head, he was leaning, he had his head resting on the egg. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he was asleep and then it hatched. I heard a whack, like, like a sound of impact, whack. And I felt a jerk, like a sudden movement and sat up. And there was the end of the egg pecked out. So the egg had been pecked out from inside. Peck is what a bird does with its beak. Peck, peck, peck. The end of the egg had, was pecked out, so open, and a little, a funny little brown head looking out at me. Lord, I said, you're welcome. And with a little difficulty, he came out. So he managed to get out of the egg. It was a nice, friendly little chap at first, like a nice, friendly little guy, about the size of a small hen. A hen is a female chicken very much like other young birds, only bigger. His plumage, that's the feathers, okay, his plumage, the colour of his feathers, was a dirty brown to begin with, with a sort of grey scab that fell off it very soon. So a scab is, well, if you cut yourself again, so uh, if you get, if you scrape your leg or something, what will blood comes out right it bleeds and then the, the the blood dries and forms a scab which covers the cut so that's a scab so it's strange like his feathers the feathers of the young bird were covered in a sort of gray crust or something a gray scab that fell off it very soon and he didn't really have feathers it was more like a kind of downy hair so i suppose these feathers were so so light and so thin and so fine that they looked more like a kind of a hair. Down, down is a sort of very, very fine, thin feathers which um, ducks and geese have. Uh, under them, big feathers, they have down feathers which are like very thin ones. You know, you go to, you know, you know those like very light, uh, warm uh, coats that people wear. You can buy them at Uniqlo and other stores. And they contain very, very fine little feathers, white feathers. Those feathers are called down, and it's very insulating. It keeps you warm. So the the, the bird is covered in this kind of these sorts of feathers, but it it looked almost more like hair than feathers. I can hardly express how pleased I was to see him. I tell you, Robinson Crusoe doesn't make nearly enough of his loneliness. Meaning Robinson Crusoe in the story doesn't talk about how lonely uh, it is. He doesn't um, explain how lonely it really is. But here, here was interesting company. He looked at me and winked his eye from the front backward. So the eyelids would, would go from the front backwards. I mean, humans, it goes from the top down. But 
for these birds the eyes wink from the front backwards like a hen and gave a chirp a chirp is like the sort of bird a, a sort of noise a bird would make like eep, eep, and began to peck about at once like pecking the ground moving his head down just acting normal <laughs> as though being hatched 300 years too late was just nothing. Good to see you, Man Friday, I said, for I'd naturally settled he was to be called Man Friday. I'd naturally decided that he would be called Man Friday if he ever hatched. Because Man Friday is, again, this is a reference to Robinson Crusoe, because Robinson Crusoe is stranded on a desert island. He thinks he's the only one there, but there is actually another person. It's like a native man. Who, who he meets and makes friends with, he calls him Man Friday because he meets him on Friday, I think. So as a reference to that, um, Butcher's companion here, this little bird, he calls it Man Friday. Um, it, I was a bit anxious about his feed, about the food I was going to feed him. So I gave him a lump of raw parrot fish, like a piece of uncooked parrot fish immediately just straight away gave him like oh my god how am i gonna i wonder how i'm gonna feed this bird and let's see if he'll eat this so he gave him a piece of raw fish he took it and opened his beak for more his beak right this is the the hard part on the front of a bird's face opened his beak like at ah, more please i was glad about that because under the circumstances if he'd been at all fussy like picky like if he didn't want to eat fish or something. If he'd been fussy and not wanted to eat fish, I should have had to eat him after all. Right? So if, if this bird wasn't going to survive, if it wasn't going to eat the things that, it, that he could give to it, like fish basically, then he would, then the, then the bird wouldn't survive and he would have to eat it. And he grew. You could almost see him grow. And as I was never a very social man, his quiet, friendly ways suited me to a T. If something suits you to a T, this is another idiom which we do use today. I mean, like the vast majority of the language that I'm talking about in this story, the vast majority, unless I've pointed it out as being old fashioned, all of this language still gets used today. So we would still say it suits me to a T. So if something suits you to a T, it just suits you really perfectly. It suits you right down to the ground. For example, you know, you know, Paris is just fantastic. It's great. You've got um, you've got the parks. You've got great restaurants. Um, there's there's a stand up comedy scene in English. I can go and do stand up. I can eat good food. Uh, my daughter's school is really not too far away. Uh, I work in walking. I work in walking distance from here. I just love living here. It suits me to a T. Right. Uh, it suits me to a T. It suits me right down to the ground, is another one that we say. For nearly two years, we were as happy as we could be on that island. I had no business worries because I knew my salary was mounting up at Dawson's. His salary was mounting up. This is a nice phrasal verb, meaning it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. A bit like a mountain or a pile. You could say it was piling up as well. So as more money gets added, it mounts up and up and up. Right now, not literally. I don't think Dawson's were put, putting money in a little pile, but in, if something is mounting up, it just means it's getting bigger and bigger. Okay, uh, right. We could see a sail now and then, but nothing ever came near us. Again, a sail, the sail of a boat. Every now and then they'd see it, but nothing came near. I amused myself, meaning I sort of kept myself amused, kept myself entertained by decorating the island with designs made from sea urchins. Sea urchins are like, um, you know, sorts of um, creatures that uh, live in the sea and their shells, they leave their shells on the, on the sand, right? So he, he, he decorates the island with these shells and sea urchins and things. I put Apionis Island all around the place very nearly. So he's, he's written Apionis Island everywhere. He's kind of like decorating it and writing the name of the island all around the place with shells in big letters, like what you see done with coloured stones at railway stations in the old country. Uh, yes, they, they do that still in England uh, at railway stations. You might have like a, a sort of little, maybe a, you might sometimes at railway stations you have 
uh, plants or flowers and they also use um, stones to make a sort of mosaic and they might write the name of the train station in these pebbles or stones uh, on the platform. They still, they still have that in some places. And mathematical calculations and drawings of various sorts. So he's doing his maths and designs and stuff with, with stones and shells and things. I used to lie watching that bloody bird stalking around. Stalking means like walking around, looking for food and growing, growing. And I'd think how I could make a living out of him. I Meaning I could make money that I could live from, right? I could make a living out of him. I could make money by showing him about if I ever got taken off that atoll. I Meaning he could take him on the road, you know, as, um, as a sort of attraction. Come and see the, the extinct bird, bra you know, come and see the extinct elephant bird back from the dead. The largest bird ever to walk the earth. It would be quite an attraction. Yeah, he could have made some money showing, showing him about. After his first molt, so a molt is when all, uh, a bird loses its feathers and its feathers are replaced with new ones. It happens every year. After his first molt, he began to get handsome, meaning he started to look nice with a crest. That's like a, a thing on the top of his head. And a blue wattle, that's like um, uh, something that hangs down below uh, the, uh, the, 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 the head of the bird. Like turkeys have a wattle. It's like a sort of a thing that hangs down the, underneath the head of a bird. So a crest on the top and a blue wattle underneath. And a lot of green feathers at his behind. So green feathers at the back. And then I used to puzzle whether Dawson's had any right to claim him or not. So he's there wondering whether Dawson's, the company, has the right to actually take possession of the bird if, if that ever happens, if it comes to it. Do they have the right to keep this bird or is this, does he belong to me? Who has the rights over this bird, he's thinking. During stormy weather and in the rainy season, we lay snug under the shelter. So they lay down together under the shelter, all comfortable and snug. I'd... Uh, uh, under the shelter I'd made out of the old canoe and I used to tell him lies about my friends at home. <laughs> this is cute because they, they'd like lie down together and keep each other warm and he would talk to the bird and sort of tell tell the bird lies about his friends back home. What? what? It's interesting that line. He would just like tell, I don't know, I don't know what quite that means that maybe he would kind of complain about his friends to, to the bird or something or just sort of like make up stories. Suppose, you know, it's the sort of thing you have to do to keep yourself sane, right? Um, and after a storm, we would go round the island together to see if there was any driftwood. Driftwood, that's wood that's drifted from the sea and ended up on the beach. We're nearly at the end here, folks. It was a kind of idyll, you might say. An idyll is a sort of a perfect, perfect situation, a kind of paradise, an idyllic scene. Beautiful, perfect situation. A kind of idyll, you might say. If only I'd had some tobacco, it would have been simply just like heaven. Uh, it was about the end of the second year our little paradise went wrong. Friday was then about 14 feet high from toe to beak, with a big broad head like the end of a pickaxe. A pickaxe is like a big heavy metal axe that you would use to dig into the to, to dig into rock, you'd use a pickaxe to to break some rock. A big, sharp, curved axe with a spiked front on it that you'd use to, like, break rock, right? Big, heavy metal axe to break rock. So he had a big, broad head like the end of a pickaxe with two huge brown eyes with yellow rims, so yellow around the edge of the eyes, set together like a man's. So the eyes were sort of together at the front. I guess binocular vision. Not out of sight of each other like a hen's. So it's like a bit like an ostrich, right? Ostriches, their eyes are together at the front of their head, not on the, not on the sides of their head, like some birds. So this one had eyes on the front, set together like a man's, not out of sight of each other like a hen's. His plumage was fine, meaning his feathers were, were beautiful. 
none of the half mourning style of your ostrich mourning if you're mourning it means you're feeling sad because someone has died and you wear black clothes right so an ostrich is like it looks like it's 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 mourning it looks kind of sad because it's just black and white um or half of its feathers are black so uh, but this bird looked much more colorful than that more like a cassowary which is another large bird that exists today all right you've got like ostriches cassowaries um and and other and emus peacocks mm -hmm. um anyway it looked more like a cassowary um which is a more colorful flightless bird peacocks aren't flightless by the way they can fly a bit um and that was when he started to act arrogantly and kind of show off in front of me and show signs of a nasty temper. So the bird, it reached a certain age and it sort of reached maturity, grew into an adult, looked beautiful, looked impressive, and probably was at the age where it could start mating with other female apiornae, apiornuses. It's probably apiornuses. Um, you know, it like come of age and its temperament changed. And it started to act arrogant, like, hmm, like I'm kind of, I'm the dominant male around here and kind of show off in front of me, like, look how big and strong I am, look at my feathers, hmm, and show signs of a nasty temper, a nasty temper, a temper is like a, if you have a nasty temper, it means you, get, you can get angry easily. At last came a time when my fishing had been rather unlucky and he began to hang about me in an odd meditative way. So there was a moment where he hadn't been able to catch any fish and uh, uh, the apionis, the bird, starts to like hang around. Hmm. Starts to hang around him. Now bear in mind this bird is like the size of an elephant at this point. He starts to sort of like hang around and maybe thinking apparently the bird is like thinking about him or something i thought he might have been eating sea cucumbers or something meaning maybe the bird was like sick or had been had gone crazy because it had been eating poisonous food but it was really just discontent on his part meaning discontent just like unhappy not happy not not satisfied with well, what was going on so it wasn't that it was sick it was just unhappy Oh, I'm hungry. Where's my food? Because remember, uh, Butcher would feed the bird fish that he caught. I was hungry too, he said. And when I finally landed a fish, I wanted it for myself. Tempers were short that morning on both sides. So you can have, if you have a short temper, it means you're getting angry easily. Tempers were short, meaning both of them were getting angry easily on both sides, both him and the bird. He pecked at it, so he, he caught a fish, and the bird pecked at the fish and grabbed it. So his head came in and he grabbed the fish, and Butcher gave him a whack on the head to make him let go, like Psh! maybe slapped him or smacked him to make him let go of the fish. And at that, meaning when that happened, he went for me. So uh, the bird attacked him. God! He gave me this in the face. The man pointed to his scar. So he must have pecked him in the face and cut his face open. Then he kicked me. It was like a cart horse. A cart horse is one of those huge, big um, horses that you see on farms. The ones that are really big with big, big legs that would carry the cart around. I got up and seeing he hadn't finished, I ran off full tilt meaning at full speed, with my arms doubled up over my face. This is where he's like Jackie Chan, <laughs> defending himself, right, blocking the attacks of this big bird. My arms doubled up over my, fa my face, so he ran away like with his arms over his head, but he, but he ran on those gawky legs. Gawky means sort of like large and cumbersome and uncomfortable, uh, uh, large, cumbersome and awkward looking, big, big legs. He ran on those gawky legs of his, faster than a racehorse, and kept striking out at me with sledgehammer kicks. A sledgehammer is a big, blunt-ended, large hammer that you would wield with two hands, whang, and you'd use that to knock down a wall. 
that's a sledgehammer. So he kept striking out at me with sledgehammer kicks. Basically, he kept kicking at Butcher, and it was like being kicked by, like being hit by a sledgehammer. And bringing his pickaxe, meaning his head, down on the back of my head. So he was pecking him with his beak and kicking him with his legs. I made for the lagoon, meaning I went, ran in, ran to, into the lagoon, into the lake, and went up to my neck. So he's in the middle of the water, up to his neck. He stopped at the water, this is the bird, because he hated getting his feet wet, and he started to make a big fuss, right? Started to make a big performance, somewhat resembling a peacock's display. So he's like going up and down, shaking his tail feathers and being aggressive, but with a harsher tone. So like a peacock's display, but more aggressive, more nasty. He started strutting up and down the beach, like walking, like, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> like showing off his strength. I'll admit I felt pretty small to see this fossil lording it over me. A fossil, fossil is normally something you would dig out of the ground. It's um, the remains of a, an ancient animal that's been preserved in the rock. So m most of the time, remains of dinosaurs are in the form of fossils. It's basically where the, a body of an animal has been preserved in, in earth, which has then turned to rock. And um, you still, you get a preserved shape. It's when a, the bones or body of a creature has turned to stone, right? So it's basically another way of saying this ex extinct animal. I felt pretty small to see this fossil lording it over me. If someone lords over, it means they are in power, like a lord, right? So suddenly he was in the powerful position, right? And my head and face were all bleeding, so blood was coming out. And, well, my body was just one jelly of bruises. Jelly is a kind of uh, soft food made from gelatine, wobbly, soft stuff. Um, uh, just a jelly of bruises. So if you get hit, um, right, if your body gets hit, then it ends up with a bruise that's like a uh, dark blue, dark black mark where the, where the skin and muscle has been damaged. So his body was covered in bruises and his head and face were bleeding. He'd been beaten up by this bird. I decided to swim across the lagoon and leave him alone for a bit until the whole thing blew over. If something blows over, it just sort of goes past, a bit like a storm. A storm would come, and the storm and then blows over. Eventually, the wind blows it away. Similarly, a bad situation can just blow over. Like, oh, you know, a lot of trouble. Um, oh, just wait for it to blow over, meaning wait for it to just move away, go away naturally. So he, wait, he went to the other side of the island to wait for the whole situation to blow over. Like he thought maybe with time, the bird would just, like, go back to normal. I shinned up the tallest palm tree, meaning climbed up it. Your shins are the front of the lower part of your legs. So you kind of like using your legs, you wrap your legs around and just like kind of climb up the tree. He shinned up the tallest palm tree and sat there thinking about it all. I don't suppose I ever felt so hurt by anything before or since. It was the brutal ingratitude of the creature. Now, gratitude is when you feel thankful. Thank you so much. You know, I just want to express my gratitude. I'm so grateful for all the help you've given me, right? In this case, ingratitude is when you don't show that you're thankful. So if you do so much work for someone, you help them, and they don't even say thank you. Honestly, the ingratitude of these kids, for example, right? In this case, it was the brutal ingratitude of the creature. This creature who he'd rescued from extinction and had protected had not eaten right and had uh looked after and fed and cared for like it like a family member and then it attacks him and tries to kill him just how ungrateful the brutal ingratitude of the creature i'd been more than a brother to him a great gawky out-of-date bird and me a human being heir of the ages and all that heir of the ages if you're the heir of something it means you 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 inherit something for example if you know um 
you know, like Prin- uh, Prince William is heir to the throne. When King Charles dies, William will become the king. So he's the heir of the throne. Similarly, if, you know, um, there's a family, the, fa- the, 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 the father and mother own the house. And if you, um, when, when the, the parents die, the house goes to the children, goes to the son or daughter, let's say, and that person is the heir to the house, the heir of the house. So heir of the ages means that the humans have, have inherited the ages, meaning the humans, uh, the ages, meaning all of time and all of existence, the, the humans have, had become the primary species on earth. So a great gawky out of date bird and me, human being, heir of the ages and all that. I thought after a time he'd begin to see things in that light himself, meaning he'd just sort of see things in that way of like, just realize actually there's uh this isn't right and the the bird would change his mind and feel a little sorry for his behavior as if to say oh i'm sorry you're a human being aren't you i've got no place uh trying to kill you but of course that's not going to happen i thought if i was to catch some nice little bits of fish perhaps and then go to him in a casual kind of way like bring some fish hey you want some fish maybe and offer them to him he might do the sensible thing right sensible thing like the the reasonable thing It took me some time to learn how spiteful and bad-tempered an extinct bird can be. Spiteful. If someone is spiteful, it means they hold bad feelings against someone after something has happened. In this case, not giving him the fish the first time round, and the bird is still holding on to the bad feelings. He's so spiteful. It's like, will you just forgive me, please? And bad-tempered. We've had that in a bad mood, angry all the time. It took me some time to learn how spiteful and bad-tempered an extinct bird can be. Pure malice. Malice is just like, just bad feeling or bad intentions towards someone. So this bird only uh, only had bad intentions and feelings toward the man. He had absolutely no uh, indication or no willingness to to make peace. Uh, He just wanted to attack the man and uh, had just become his mortal enemy at that point just sort of overnight almost i won't tell you all the little tricks i tried to win that bird round again if you try to win someone round it means you try to when they don't like you and they've they they have feelings against you if you try and win them round you try and persuade them and change their mind so it's like will you you know would you like some fish look you know maybe we can Look, I tell you what, you're a fantastic bird. You're so beautiful. Look, I'm going to give you all this fish. Aren't you wonderful? I'll build a special thing just for you. Now, will you, you know, will can't, can't we be friends? So I'm trying to win him round. Don't try to win me round. Right, said the bird. <laughs> um, I won't tell you all the little tricks I tried to win that bird round again. I simply can't. It makes my cheek burn with shame. So it makes his face goes red and hot with shame. He feels ashamed and embarrassed and he probably feels kind of stupid the way the pathetic way he tried to win favor even now to think of the snubs and buffets i had from this infernal curiosity snubs and buffets this is basically when the bird says no so he tried something and the bird was like no just rejected all of his attempts all the snubs and buffets I had from this infernal, this hellish, this damned curiosity, right? The curiosity of just an interesting thing. And that's kind of what the bird is at this stage. I mean, it's, it's got no... It's just a, a, a unique curiosity, the sort of thing that you would see in a museum. Um, I tried violence. I, tr- I chucked lumps of coral at him. So he threw lumps of coral at him chucked means through throw through thrown chuck chucked chucked he chucked lumps of corals at him from a safe distance but he only swallowed them so he threw this coral at him yeah there you go threw the coral at him and the bird just (coughs) just swallowed them (laughs) ate them and they went down into his stomach i threw my open knife at him (coughs) and almost lost it so we almost lost the knife, I don't know where, into the water or something, though it was too big for him to swallow. So the bird tried to, tried to swallow the knife but couldn't. I tried starving him out, meaning tried to 
uh, starve him out, meaning, um, I guess, control him by by um, uh, starving him, like not giving him any food, and stuck to fishing for myself. But he took to picking along the beach, so I, I he, he he tried starving him. Uh, not giving him food, and stuck to fishing for myself. I only fished for myself. He took to picking along the beach at, at low water, like going along the beach, um, collecting things, uh, going after worms, trying to get worms out of the sand. And he got by on that. He survived on that. Half my time I spent up to my neck in the lagoon, and the rest up the palm trees. One of them was hardly even high enough. So it was almost not high enough. And when he caught me up it, so when the bird came, maybe if his, when, when the bird found him in that particular tree, he had a regular bank holiday with the calves of my legs. <laughs> nice expression. A bank holiday is a public holiday, right? But basically, just if you have a regular bank holiday, this is not a common expression, this one. But I suppose it means that he had a really good time, like just had a free, good time attacking the the back lower parts of his legs so we've got the shins which is the front hard part of the front of the bottom of your legs below the knee the front that's the shins and below the knee at the back the muscly part that's the calves so he, basically when he caught him up that lower tree he attacked had a great time attacking the calves of his legs it got unbearable like he couldn't stand it anymore I don't know if you've ever tried sleeping up a palm tree. It gave me the most horrible nightmares. Think of the shame of it too. Here was this extinct animal. Extinct, I mean, I don't know if, if you've caught this by now, but extinct means they don't exist anymore. I explained that before. Here was this extinct animal stalking about my island. Stalking about, like, walking around like, you know, like a bird like this would do. Walking up and down on long legs. Stalking about my island like a sulky duke. A duke is um, a member of the aristocracy. You've got like king, prince, and then you've got lord, duke. You know, these are like other forms of aristocrat. So someone in a someone with a powerful uh, position, right? But a sulky duke. Sulky means unhappy, sort of mm, someone who's like unhappy and always in a bad mood. So there was this powerful, unhappy thing walking around his island and me not allowed to rest the sole of my foot on the place. So Butcher is saying, this was my island. And here I am, uh, I've been replaced as the, as the owner of the island. Now I've got this unhappy bird walking around like some kind of unhappy aristocrat who owns the place. And I'm not even allowed to put the sole of my foot on the island. The sole of your foot is the underside of your foot. Quite a lot of vocab for feet and legs in this in this episode, it seems. The sole of your foot, the underside of your foot, the heel of your foot, the, the back part, uh, the shin of your leg, the calf of your leg. Um, so he's not even allowed to put his foot on the island. I used to cry with weariness. Weariness is exhaustion and tiredness. I used to cry with weariness and frustration. I told him straight. So he's like, now look here, bird. I told him straight that I didn't mean to be chased about a desert island by any damned anachronisms. So, now look here, I don't mean to be chased around this island. Are you listening? I don't, I'm not going to be chased around this island by any out of date, extinct bird. It's like some anachronism. An anachronism is something that's out of time, that's in the wrong time. For example, if you're watching a film, that's, let's say you're watching Gladiator, which is supposed to be set during the time of ancient Rome, and you see someone with a mobile phone. That's obviously an anachronism. It's like uh, they didn't have phones back in those days. So that would be an anachronism. In this case, the bird is an anachronism, is an anachronism, an anachronism, because this is this bird in the, from the wrong time. Basically, it's in the wrong time. I told him to go and peck someone his own age. Normally, if, if there's a bully, like an older child picking on a younger child, you would say, go and pick on someone your own size. Right, a, a, big, a big guy picking on a small guy, you would say, go and pick on someone your own size, leave him alone. 
It's like not fair. So I told him to go and peck someone his own age. But he only snapped his beak at me. Snap, snap. Great ugly bird, all legs and neck. I wouldn't like to say how long that went on in total. I mean, it went on a long time. I'd have killed him sooner if I'd known how. So this basically, the, the guy has been pushed to the absolute limit by this situation. And in the end, he's got no choice but to, to kill the bird because it's, it's, it's kill or be killed or kill or just sort of starve to death or just go completely mad. I'd have killed him sooner if I'd known how. But eventually I hit on a way of dealing with him at last. So I hit on a way I uh, like discovered or worked out a way, realized a way, came up with a way of dealing with him. It's an old South American trick. I joined all my fishing lines together with stems of seaweed and things and made a kind of uh, kind of tough string. So he's using all the things he's got, like fishing lines and bits of seaweed and stuff, and he made a sort of long string in order to make this old South American weapon called a bola, which is basically a kind of a cord or a string or a rope with two heavy weights at the end. You spin it round and throw it, and it wraps itself around the thing that you're trying to catch. It's called a bola. I, I understand. He fastened uh, two lumps of coral rock to the ends of this. It took me some time to do it because every now and then I had to go into the lagoon or up a tree when he came by. Eventually I had it ready, a kind of roughly assembled bowler. This I whirled, like spun, he spun it round his head. He, uh, this I whirled rapidly, quickly around my head and then let it go, sort of like threw it so it flew through the air. So spinning it round and then just let it go. The first time I missed, but the next time the string caught his legs. So the string got his leg and it caught his legs beautifully and wrapped round them again and again. Over he went, meaning he fell over. I threw it standing waist deep in the lagoon. And as soon as he went down, I was out of the water and soaring at the neck with soaring at his neck with my knife. So this is terribly sad and like the adrenaline, right, the excitement, the, the desperation, but it's so sad that he has to kill it. So he, he, he throws the bowler at it, it catches its legs, it, it wraps around its le his legs and the bird falls down and he leaps at it with his knife and he starts cutting at its neck, sawing. So sawing is like what you do when you cut wood. <laughs> So moving the knife up and down. Um, I don't like to think of that even now. I felt like a murderer while I did it, though my anger was hot against him. When I stood over him and saw him bleeding on the white sand and his beautiful great legs and neck writhing in his last agony, it broke my heart. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really sad. Um, I saw him bleeding on the white sand, his beautiful great legs and neck writhing. So writhing again is like moving, twisting a bit like a snake, like the way the, wa the waves on the beach were writhing towards him before. So in this case, his neck is writhing around, like moving around, you know, like you'd imagine it would be. Like a bit like a, a, a snake that's been caught, its body writhes around in his last agony. So it was dying. Uh, agony is like strong pain. It's terribly, terribly sad. Really, really sad moment. With that tragedy, loneliness came upon me like a curse. Like sort of like bad magic. Like I'd been cursed. Like someone had put bad magic on me. Loneliness came upon me like a curse. Good Lord, you can't imagine how I missed that bird. I sat by his corpse, meaning his dead body, and sorrowed over him. Sorrow is deep, deep sadness. If you sorrow over something, I mean, don't think it's normally used of, as a verb, not in my experience. I mean, it can be, but um, you've just felt deep sorrow and, and felt so sad and shivered. So <laughs> if you shiver, it means you shake like that normally when you're cold, but it could be if you're like emotionally really distressed. I sat by his corpse and sorrowed over him and shivered as I looked around the desolate, silent reef. So as he looked around this place where he was, this desolate place, desolate means there's no life there. 
I thought of what a jolly, like a what a happy, what a jolly little bird he'd been when he was hatched, and of a thousand pleasant tricks he'd played before he went wrong. So he's just remembering all the good times. You can imagine flashbacks of him playing with the bird, oh, and the bird doing a funny thing, the bird like, you know, flapping its wings or bobbing its head, and him throwing a shell, and the bird pecking the shell and bringing it back to him, and ah, oh, and then them cuddling, ah. Oh. So he thought of all the jolly little things that all the pleasant tricks he'd played before he went wrong. I thought if I'd only wounded him, like only hurt him, given him an injury. A wound, injury, I think a wound is something that um, if someone attacks you or if you have an accident, you would have a wound. An injury would be like something you would sustain while playing sport, for example. F sports, like footballers get injured, but... Um, uh, like a hunter might be wounded if an animal attacks him, right? Um, anyway, so if, if I'd only wounded him, I might have nursed him round into a better understanding. Nursed him round, like wounded him and then like helped him to get better. And while helping him to get better, maybe, you know, repaired the relationship so that the bird would, you know, they have a better understanding together. So that the bird realised that, you know, that he didn't need to attack him. But clearly that's just like the, the instinct of the bird was just too strong. If I'd had any means of digging into the coral rock, I'd have buried him. I Meaning if I'd been able to dig into the rock, I would have buried him, but he couldn't do that. I felt exactly as if he was human. As it was, I couldn't think of eating him, so I put him in the lagoon and the little fishes picked him clean. So the little fishes that, all, that slowly but surely ate him, ate all the flesh off his skeleton. I didn't even save the feathers. Then one day, a chap cruising about in a yacht took it upon himself to see if my atoll still existed. So this is the bit where he gets rescued. One day, a chap, a man, cruising about, just like, you know, moving around on his yacht, right? Travelling around on his yacht, you know, pleasant, you know, like in, in, pleasantly exploring the area in his yacht, took it upon himself, meaning decided, to see if my atoll still existed. So a man on in his yacht was like, oh, I want, let's go and have a look over there. Let's see if, maybe he's got a map or something. It's like, I'm just exploring the islands around here, just seeing if they're still here. And he turned up and discovered Butcher there. I wonder what he looked like. He didn't come a moment too soon, meaning he didn't come a moment too soon, meaning he came at the right time. For I was about sick enough of the desolation of it. He was, he was sick enough of the desolation, the, uh, just the, the, the lack of life, really. And only hesitating whether I should walk out into the sea and be done with it all that way or fall back on the green things. So basically he's saying that the boat, the guy with the boat came at the right time because I was... I was just deciding whether I would kill myself this way or kill myself this way. So he was definitely going to commit suicide. Either by walking out into the sea or to fall back on the green things. I'm not sure what fall back on the green things means, to be honest. I'm assuming it means that there were some plants, spiky plants, spiky green plants, that if he'd fallen onto them, they would have spiked him and maybe killed him. That's the only thing I can think. I saw, I, I sold the bones, so these are the bones of the bird which had been uh, picked clean. Uh, I sold the bones to a man named Winslow, a dealer near the British Museum, and he says he sold them to old Havers. It seems Havers didn't understand they were extra large, and it was only after his death they attracted attention. They called them Apionis. What was it? So this is Butcher saying that he'd sold them to one man, the, that man sold them to a guy called Havers. Havers didn't realise that these were extra large bones. Havers died, and it was only after that that the bones actually attracted any attention. So it's basically talking about the fate of the bones. And, he's, and Butcher says, they called them Apionis. What was it? And the narrator, the original narrator, says, Apionis Vastus, I said. It's funny, the very thing was mentioned to me by a friend of mine. They were found, they f when they found an Apionis with a thigh a yard long, they thought they'd reached the top of the scale and called him Apionis Maximus. Then someone, so basically the, the, the narrator at this point is saying that, describing the way that um, they, different uh, apionuses had been discovered 
and the scientists who uh, record the different uh, species, you know, they they keep coming up. <laughs> they they have to keep coming up with new names to refer to how big the bird is. So you've got Apionis, Apionis maximus. This has to be the biggest one, right? We'll call it Apionis maximus. And then another one was found, which was bigger than the Maximus. And they're like, okay, what should we call this one? Oh, uh, uh, let's call it Apionis Titan, the, the bigger one. And then it's like, um, oh, we found, we found more Apionis bones, even bigger. Oh, what should we call this one? Oh, God. Um, oh, we'll have to call it A Apion Apionis Vastus. And then Apionis Vastissimus. Um, Winslow told me the same thing, said the man with the scar. If they get any more Apionises, he reckons some top-level scientist will go and burst a blood vessel. So if you, <laughs> if you burst a blood vessel, it means that because you get so stressed out that like a blood, bressel, a blood vessel in your brain would burst. So this would be that if you go to the scientists again and bring another bigger Apionis skeleton that the scientists would be just like because he wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to take it you know it would be too much having to think of yet another name for an even bigger one anyway butcher ends his story by saying but it was a strange thing to happen to a man wasn't it altogether and that's how the story ends and yes it, it is a strange thing it was a strange thing to happen to a man altogether wasn't it really um and that's the end of this episode. I mean, this what should we call this? This is like Luke's English podcast, Maximus. Luke's English podcast, Vastus. Luke's English podcast, <laughs> Titan. <laughs> Certainly the longest episode ever. Uh, so it's probably time. It's probably best, isn't it, for me to end this now. Thank you so much for listening. What did you think of the story? I mean, so much in this. I mean, it's super long marathon episode. So many words and phrases there. Remember, you can get the PDF yourself. Just check the link in the description and you can just get it and you can see all the stuff I said, including loads of the vocab all highlighted for, for your reference. Um, OK, but, you know, leave a comment if you made it this far, if you survived, if you're a survivor, if you're like Butcher from the story and you survived all the way through to the end of the story, um, then leave me a comment to let you let me know that you're still here. What? What? I mean, how long is your beard? <laughs> uh, uh, I suppose that's only for the men to answer. Um, uh, but uh, yeah. Anyway, let me know and just tell me that you're not a skeleton that's been picked clean by parrotfish in a lagoon in the middle of an atoll uh, somewhere off the coast of Madagascar. Okay, let me know that that's not you. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really do. Um, I did my best with that one, uh, but we'll see. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, have a nice day, afternoon, morning, evening or night. Congratulations for getting to the end of this. Uh, hopefully that, hopefully it wasn't a challenge. Hopefully it was a, it was a pleasure. But anyway, um, that's up to you to decide. Have a good day, afternoon, evening, morning, night. Speak to you in the next episode of this podcast. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye.